I'm Hugh Hewitt in Studio North. Overnight, the Third Lebanon War began as Israel invaded southern Lebanon with the 98th Division Special Operators and other forces about which we are not yet aware. It's the third time Israel has invaded Lebanon, 1982, 2006, and now 2024. There is no definitive explanation of how far and how fast the Israeli Defense Forces will move. There are leaks from American officials who did not want it to happen in the first place and have been wrong at every turn, and it appears that Israel is simply ignoring President Biden, who is, I think, basically incapacitated, as well as Tony Blinken and Jake Sullivan and Lloyd Austin, and they are doing so because the security of Israel depends upon pushing back Hezbollah, a a terrorist organization that's in complete disarray after lightning strikes by Israel over the last two weeks on a variety of its operatives, including its uh, Supreme Commander Nasrallah, who was killed over the weekend. But before that, as you can see in a Fox News column, which I have posted over at my Hugh Hewitt account on X and at Fox News at my entitled Israel Unbound, and I lay out in Israel Unbound, everything that Israel has done over the last three months. And this includes Benjamin Netanyahu's trip to the United States, where Vice President Harris boycotted his speech to Congress. His meetings thereafter, the Prime Minister's meeting with Joe Biden and Harris, and what appears to be his conclusion that Joe Biden is a husk of himself, Kamala Harris is anti-Israel, and I'm going to go back and tell the War Cabinet, the Security Cabinet, it's actually called, I'm going to broaden my government, and we're going to go over to the offensive against Hezbollah because we've already defeated Hamas. Uh, It's now just a guerrilla force. There are 101 hostages, and Netanyahu and his government committed to getting them back. There is no one to negotiate with. Hamas is just incommunicado. And even the appeasement monkeys at the State Department have said, you know, Hamas isn't responding. So Netanyahu's gone over to the offensive, and he wants the people of Israel to be able to go back to their northern border, back to their towns, rebuild, and I hope the United States Congress uh, sends a significant appropriation to assist in that process. Because they are our ally, and they deserve at least as much help as we give to any other state in the world, and not just military help, in this case, economic help, because it's been a devastated region. Remember, Hezbollah began this war on October 8th, the day after the massacre by Hamas in the south. Two different terrorist organizations, both funded by Iran. A third terrorist organization, Hezbollah, fired another couple of missiles at Israel they did not hit yesterday, but Israel blew up all. I don't know if there's anything left except to bounce the rubble in Yemen. Uh, But if there's rubble to be bounced, Israel's going to do it. Going over to the offensive this way with the 98th Paratrooper Division and supporting tanks and forces, I will talk later with Ambassador David Friedman whose brand new book, One Jewish State, came out last week, and I listened to it over the last couple of days. It's an amazing book. I'll be joined by Dr. Michael Oren as well, former Israeli ambassador to the United States. Senator Tom Cotton will be along. And I'll be talking about tonight's debate between J.D. Vance and Governor Tim Walz. The first question ought to be, uh, gentlemen, your assessment of Israel's actions in the last three weeks. That's it. There's no need for any, what, what do you assess? Uh, We will be covering the debate on the Salem News Channel tonight, beginning before the debate at 7 p.m., simulcasting the debate over the Salem Radio Network and the Salem News Channel, and then coming back for special debate coverage on the Salem News Channel. And I will, of course, be here at 6 a.m. in the morning uh, to tell you everything that happened and didn't happen. It will be three-on-one again. Remember, Margaret Brennan, Nora O'Donnell are both leftists. And they, they won't be fair. They can't be fair. CBS isn't organized to be fair. It doesn't matter. Whatever the question is, J.D. Vance ought to talk about the weakness of the Biden administration that has led to a war in Ukraine, the collapse of the Afghanistan 20-year effort, the death at Abbey Gate, and now how we have held back our ally Israel for over almost a year. And they've just finally shrugged off Kamala Harris, Joe Biden, Tony Blinken, and Jake Sullivan. And they're going to win. They are winning. And they are not going to stop as America stopped Israel at the gates of Rafah. They ought not to have stopped the first time in April. They ought to have hit Iran hard. None of this might have been necessary. The hostages might have been back if Iran had been hit hard the way that Israel wanted to do until Joe Biden told them to, quote, take the win. We do not know how far the president's incapacity was advanced to that moment when that happened. Uh, But the key is, 
Israel's gone over to the offensive. Now, a lot of you don't read a lot of military history, and yesterday's conversation between Jack Carr and myself and uh, his co-author, uh, Mark Knowles, James Knowles, excuse me, uh, on targeted Beirut, laid out the fact that we should be rejoicing in the United States over Hezbollah's dismantling. Hezbollah killed many Americans in April of 1983 when they bombed the U.S. Embassy. They killed even more Americans, mostly Marines, in October of 1983. And for 41 years, we've done nothing. There were plans on the table. They were not adopted. Cap Weinberger did not want to strike back at Hezbollah. So for 40 years, those Marines, those diplomats, those Central Intelligence Agency operatives were unavenged. They are now avenged thanks to our ally, Israel. And if there's one thing you do today, go and find the commentary podcast from yesterday. It included, of course, Editor-in-Chief John Podoritz, Abe Greenwald, the Managing Editor, Seth Mandel, the Senior Editor, Christine Rosen, the media columnist for commentary and a fellow at the AEI and the author of the brand new book that I had talking to you about last week and The Extinction of Experience and Matt Continenti, Commentary Magazine, Washington, D.C. columnist. And they had Dan Senor from Call Me Back. And they were in a celebratory mood because Nasrallah was dead. 10 other senior Hezbollah commanders were dead that followed the assassinations of other senior Hezbollah commanders in the Radwan force, as well as the chief of staff of the military arm of Hezbollah, they're reeling backwards. They have no idea. There is no command and control. Remember the beeper uh, operation followed by the walkie-talkie operation? Well, now Israel's going to destroy all those tunnels south of the Latani River. They're going to wipe out the villages from which an October 7th style invasion was intended to proceed. And they should be doing so with the applause and support of every American who favors peace in the region. When Ambassador David Friedman joins me in hour three today after Senator Cotton, we're going to talk about the future of Israel and what the United States ought to support. And it's his opinion that the sovereignty of Israel ought to be extended over Judea and Samaria, referred by most people as the West Bank. But I think I'm going to adopt the Judea and Samaria language. It will take some relearning. Uh, you know, I've been broadcasting since 1990 and calling it the West Bank. But we'll talk extensively with David Friedman, both on and after the show. It will be on the podcast today. I do want you to stay tuned to the program throughout. I'll give you updates as Israel, you know, it's mid, mid-afternoon mid there already. And we will be getting updates as they are allowed through the military censorship that does, in fact, control media in Israel. So we don't know who's doing what, where. Do not believe any of the leaks from the State Department. Yesterday, the State Department and maybe some people at the Pentagon and the White House did their best to stop Israel from going in. Then they did their best to try and persuade Israel by leaking, leaking, leaking the plans. It's dastardly what they did. But tonight's debate ought to begin with, what do you think of what Israel has done in the past month? When Netanyahu, and John Podhortz pointed this out in yesterday's commentary podcast, when Netanyahu was giving his speech to the United Nations, his very direct challenge to the United Nations is a swamp of anti-Semitism. He knew in his head that the bombers were flying towards Beirut. He knew they were about to take out all of the senior leadership of Hezbollah. And he gave that speech with that in mind, and then he went back. Some people asserted it was part of the plan that Nasrallah would have assumed with Netanyahu at the, at the General Assembly in New York. He was somehow, quote, safe. He's a killer, so he should never be safe. No killer should ever be safe. And Israel, all strength to the IDF, I'm sure they will wipe out everything in front of them that fights back. Now, of course, the IDF fighting in the most humane way possible advised all of the residents of the villages that they were attacking directly to move. If you're in the tunnels, you're going to be assumed to be a combatant. They do not have to worry about Israeli hostages in the tunnels, so they're going to go forward. I also want to remind you that tonight, as the world is on fire, we've got to remember that this debate is being moderated by people who have absolutely no concern for fairness. Their agenda is to save Kamala Harris, who is plummeting in polls across the United States. She gave another vacuous interview, which I will play parts of for you when I come back, on a podcast. She absolutely can't go out in public. Mike, uh, Tim Waltz has not given one interview, not one. Uh, he did the interview with Dan Abash, not one solo interview. And that should tell you the buffoonery, which seems to follow him like a wake follows a ship at sea. 
We'll talk about that coming up. There's a lot ahead. But this morning, the big story, Israel goes over to the defensive in Lebanon, the third Lebanon war. It's really the first Israel-Iran war. And if Israel is struck by Iran a second time, I don't think they will listen to America's pleas to, quote, take the win, especially not from a president who really ought to be removed by the vice president and the cabinet because it's pretty clear to me he does not have the capacity to be the commander-in-chief. A little bit punchy. I kept getting up in the middle of the night because our daughter-in-law went into labor yesterday and she delivered our sixth grandchild at 121 this morning, East Coast time, seven pounds and nine ounces, 21 inches long. Great baby, another wonderful light in our life. The only thing in life that isn't overrated, our grandchildren. And it's a wonderful thing uh, to see new babies come into the world generally. Uh, and whether you are my friends or my family, we are just very celebratory this morning. I want to also let you know the debate is tonight. Now, we will be simulcasting the debate tonight at 9 p.m. Eastern, and we will be doing special Salem News Channel broadcasting beginning at 7 p.m. Eastern with Larry Elder, Andrew Wilco, and Jeff Vaughn. We'll be following it with post-debate live analysis, and I will take over in the morning at 6 a.m., do not, I, I normally don't listen to anybody after a debate, and I, I try and stay off of X during the debate, because I, I just want to make my own opinions up. I do want to, however, contrast for you the two people at the top of the ticket. Donald Trump yesterday in Georgia, passing out supplies, meeting with the beleaguered, the people devastated by Hurricane Helene, cut number 41. As you know, our country is in the final weeks of a hard-fought national election. But in a time like this, when a crisis hits, when our fellow citizens cry out in need, none of that matters. We're not talking about politics now. We have to all get together and get this solved. We need a lot of help. They have to have a lot of help down here. We look out for one another. We pull together. We pitch in. We persevere. And we pull it through. Uh, that is really the American spirit. That's what made It was a great America. day for Donald Trump. He did exactly what Vice President Harris ought to have done and didn't do, show up. I had Franklin Graham with him because Samaritan's Purse is on the ground there in North Carolina, not surprising, big roots in North Carolina for the Graham family. But whether it's the Salvation, Op uh, Salvation Army or Team Rubicon or Catholic Charities or Samaritan's Purse do help. The devastation is extraordinary in the three-state area, Georgia, North Carolina, and eastern Tennessee, even a little bit of western uh, Virginia, Southwest Virginia got hammered. Governor Yunkin saying he'll be there as long. Now contrast that with Kamala Harris, who released yesterday. I don't know when she taped this. She taped a podcast with the best of all the smoke with Matt Barnes and Stephen Jackson. Cut number 47. One of my guilty pleasures, especially when I'm on the road, are my Doritos. Oh, what flavor? Nacho. Nacho. Old school, original. original. Oh, Come on. Yeah. Oh, gee, Come on. Red bag. Yeah, no, that's exactly right. Red bag. That's exactly gotta have a napkin yeah, nearby. Yeah. Right? yeah. Cut number 48. Going from a show to a whole entire company. What is your kind of your economic that's plan wonderful. moving forward for people who are living paycheck to paycheck yeah. and, and struggling for groceries and, and, and rent and, and homeowners? So look, I grew up so my my sister and I were raised by our mother. We lived for a long time. Oh, we've heard on, this before. Cut know, number 49 an incredible family and incredible friends. My best friend from kindergarten is still one of my best friends. Love it. We've heard that before. Cut number 50. Look, from the time that the president called me and told me he wasn't running, mm -hmm. I mean, it just like everything was in speedy, speedy motion. And I was not sleeping so well. And that one morning, I just, I, I mean, I had, I don't know, a few hours sleep. And I, you know, I like to sleep. Mm -hmm. I just got up, I was like, and so I just went out and got a pork roast and started marinating. <laughs> See, time to work. Get in your right, happy the, place. You notice that her accent is different. These are young black men who are running the podcast, the best of all the smoke, and Kamala's doing the chameleon stuff, and it's just not going to work. Kamala Harris gave a briefing yesterday on the disaster in the central states uh, at FEMA. Cut 51. The press took a picture. She took no questions because, of course, she has no answers. David Bonson joins me, one of my great economic contributors. You often see David on Fox Business and on CNBC. Good morning, David. How are you? 
I'm doing great, Hugh. Good morning. Good morning to you. I want to begin. I told my friend Aaron Chadbourne, who Aaron is the weekend host on WGAN up in Portland. I went down and sat with him at uh, 98.5 News Talk and 560 AM in, in Maine on Saturday. I drove down to see him. I told him I never do the futures market because, you know, my show is sometimes listened to by people late in the day. But the futures market this morning is an exception because it's up even though Israel entered Lebanon and the war is expanding. Are you surprised by that, that the futures are sort of indifferent to, if not celebrating, Israel going over to the offensive? Well, uh, Hugh, the futures are down now a little bit, but they're not down a lot. And so you could argue, you know, the, it, right now the futures point to a Dow being down 140 points, um, which is nothing anymore. I mean, as a percentage, it would be like the old days, the Dow being down 20 or 30 points because the denominator is so large. Um, what's more, far more surprising and has been for some time is oil prices response, which is good to say almost none at all. Um, oil had averaged, let's call it, between $73 and $85 most of the year. And lately, as things have escalated with Israel and various activities with Lebanon, all the issues with Gaza, from Hamas all the way now to more recent with Hezbollah, it's averaged 68 to 73. Oil prices have been lower. It's at 67, it, 65. It, it's interesting. Mine show the futures up, David, on the CNN, but I trust your numbers better. Uh, West Texas is at 67, 65, rent crude at 71, 24. You're right. That's low. Yes, it is. And, and I promise the future, I'm not sure you, there may be a delay in the feed or whatever. Futures, I've been up for an hour and a half and they've been down most of the morning. So there may be something wrong with CNN, which, you know, wouldn't be the first time CNN's been wouldn't wrong. Wouldn't be the first time. No. Um, so David, I the second the thing, reason, go ahead. I was just going to say real quickly, real quickly on the oil markets. I think a lot of it is just that the markets have been fooled so many times that a geopolitical escalation was about to happen and cut off oil supply, and it hasn't happened. So traders are afraid to act on that. And then in the meantime, there has been a lot more supply that's come online. Well, the one thing that could get people jittery is if Iran hits Israel, this time I think Israel will blow up Karg Island. And that would have a real impact. I think they'll just smithereens wow. it. What kind of impact would that have on these oil prices? Well, I mean, to the extent that there's if that something like that were to happen and there was the supply shock that I believe there would be, it would push oil prices up substantially. But there's two levels to this. There's the immediate response, which is usually somewhat irrational and just everybody assuming something very badly. But then there's the more fundamental response, which could play out over a week or two. I think that would be quite detrimental as well. Okay, that, that's thing number one. I really wanted to talk to you about the International Longshoremen's Association strike. Now, their president made a statement yesterday. His name is Harold Daggett. It takes a minute 40, but I want our audience to hear it. I want your response at the other side. Here is Harold Daggett, president of the International Longshoremen Association, which have shut down the ports of the United States in the East Coast. Let me explain something to you. These people today don't know what a strike is. When my men hit the streets from Maine to Texas, every single port, a lockdown. You know what's going to happen? I'll tell you. First week, be all over the news every night, boom, boom. Second week, guys who sell cars can't sell cars because the cars ain't coming in off the ships. They get laid off. Third week, malls start closing down. They can't get the goods from China. They can't sell clothes. They can't do this. Everything in the United States comes on a ship. They go out of business. Construction workers get laid off because the materials aren't coming in. The steel's not coming in. The lumber's not coming in. They lose their job. Everybody's hating the longshoremen now because now they realize how important our jobs are. Now I have the president screaming at me. I'm putting a Taff Hartley on you. Go ahead. Taff Hartley means I have to go back to work for 90 days. That's a cooling off period. Do you think when I go back for 90 days, those men are going to go to work on that pier? It's going to cost the money, the company's money to pay their salaries. Well, they go went from 30 moves an hour, maybe to eight. They're going to be like this. Who's going to win here in the long run? You're better off sitting down and let's get a contract and let's move on with this world. And in today's world, I'll cripple you. 
I will cripple you, and you have no idea what that means. So, David Bonson, I don't know if he's from New York or New Jersey or Boston. I can't quite figure out the accent. But what about Harold Daggett? Is he going to cripple us? No, but it is an incredibly transparent interview, isn't it, for him to yes. state to the American people that the leverage he has is he wants to try and cripple the American economy. It is a difficult way to negotiate. Um, again, I recognize the difference when violence is not involved, but it rhetorically is a terrorist talk, that, that you're going to do such great damage that someone's going to have to give you what you want. That is um, not a way to win friends and influence people, and he's wrong that that tactic is what is going to be effective because ultimately the public sentiment will turn fast with more people like you playing that clip. Well, that, that clip's going to go viral because it is a throwback to 30s-style union rhetoric. And it's got... That's right. It, it, he's, been a, he's been running the ILA for 15 or 20 years. Harold Daggett's been around forever. And the longshoremen, ever since Eric Hoffer entered my world, matter a lot to me. They work hard. Uh, but they also, I don't think they can shut down the economy. I don't think malls are going to close. I don't, think, I don't think there's any shortage of cars for like three months. Am I right? You are absolutely right. There is always marginal uh, uh, challenges that can happen. But a shutdown, the idea, no cars, no lumber, no steel, it reflects an incredibly ignorant understanding of the complexity of supply chains and the contingencies that are already in place. I mean, before, Longshoremen didn't go on strike. COVID, they shut down the whole world. And supply chains were dramatically impacted over a period of time. But we're talking, but they didn't shut everything down. 78% of cargo still got through and so forth. This is not good. And there are delays and marginal impact. But that kind of rhetoric is so over the top, it's really creepy to hear. Now, I want to close by asking you about energy. I think energy is freedom. I've talked with Doug Burgum about this. I own some Microsoft, so I always declare that. I was very happy when Microsoft bought Three Mile Island. David, what are you telling the investors that you advise at the Bonson Group about energy stocks, energy production, and the firms like Microsoft that are moving to secure available base loads? Well, there's a number of different elements. I mean, at a high level, just philosophically, energy independence is deeply connected to the supply side economic ideology. Those who favor lower taxes and favor uh, deregulation have to be supportive of energy independence. But it also is one of the elements in American policy that has a strong geopolitical ramification. So there's a whole lot of reasons why I support a robust energy portfolio for policymakers, and to me, the electricity production needs we have have no chance of ever being met apart from natural gas. So if somebody tells you we need more power, we're big AI guys, we're big tech guys, but no, we don't want natural gas, and, and that includes exporting LNG to the rest of the world, but it's particularly just within our domestic needs. Um, an energy portfolio from an investor standpoint needs to be centered around the ability to produce natural gas, which we have that in spades, but to ship and move and store natural gas, which policymakers seem hell-bent on trying to impede. Last question, David Bonson. You talk to very smart people every day. Some of the world's wealthiest people invest with the Bonson Group because they they're like me. They, they follow it, but they don't want to make decisions. What do you tell them about the election? What does your spidey sense tell you about the election? Well, uh, you're accidentally giving me a chance to tout uh, DividendCafe.com, which is my weekly investment writing. I just posted on Friday, I do it every four years, a pretty extensive white paper on the ramifications of the election. So it's posted right now at DividendCafe.com for free. But the, the Reader's Digest view is that there are different elements pros and cons that can come out of different results. And historically, the biggest mistake people make is believing that the number one driver of their portfolio is who's president. The uh, returns over four year periods, Republican or Democrat, since the beginning of the 20th century are almost identical. However, there are on the margin different sectors that are gonna be impacted differently. You know, the energy sector has done very well under uh, Biden-Harris because they have helped boost prices up 
eliminate competition for producers, which has helped incumbent names like Exxon and Chevron. I think in a Trump administration, you're going to get more support for export LNG, pipelines, new permit approvals, and hopefully new E&P, smaller cap names. So in both cases, it helps the energy sector, but it helps it differently. But the main thing, Hugh, I'm sorry for going on so long, her crazy tax policies are never going to become law. And so we should speak out against it. We should talk about the dangers of a wealth tax, of taxing unrealized capital gains. It's never going to happen. Not only because the Republicans hey, are going to win that seat. Take a minute, Senate, David. You, you take one minute to explain to people. It is the nuttiest, craziest. It's also unconstitutional. But tell people what happened yeah. with an unrealized capital gains tax. It, it is unconstitutional. It would never see light of day. And people say, well, what if the Republicans do lose the Senate? There aren't 50 Democrats that will vote for it either, just so we're clear. At least not at this point in the Democrat Party. They don't even have 50 Democrats. Even without Manchin and Cinema, they don't have 50 Democrats. But taxing unrealized capital gains is philosophically insane. And, and it would create a level of complexity and misallocation of resources and other just uh, adjustment around it that it would be highly uh, destructive to the economy. But it will not happen. Capital flight and, occur? Of course. But even, not even just capital flight out of our borders. Even within our country, the way in which people would reallocate resources, um, this is one of the points that the art laughers of the world have been making forever is you underestimate the ability of people to act in their own self-interest to avoid irrational Amen. tax burden. Yeah. And that would be in spades if Kamala Harris's yeah. tax plan is adopted. David Bonson from the Bonson Group, thank you. DividendCafe.com, I'm gonna go over and read that during the break. One of the great sponsors of the program, Americans for Prosperity, wants you to volunteer to be in this election. AmericansforProsperity.org slash volunteer. Akash Chogli joins me now from inside the Beltway. Akash, how's the response been to the call for people to get involved in election 2024? It has been enormous, Hugh. I know you and I talk about Pennsylvania. Just to give you one data point, yesterday we knocked our 700,000th door in the state of Pennsylvania. Um, across 27 states, Hugh, we have hit 17 million doors in almost 600 races uh, across every level, federal, state, local, you name it. Obviously, we could not have done that. Um, without enormous volunteer activism. And I think you're seeing that because people understand the emergency of what's at stake this year and next year on politics and policy alike. We have five weeks to go. People can still go to americansforprosperity.org slash volunteer. Akash, what would you like the moderators to ask about the economy tonight? I want them to spend most of the time on commander-in-chief questions, Israel, Russia, China. But if there is one question on the economy, what would you like asked tonight? What is your simple playbook? What are the three steps you are going to take to bring down inflation and reduce the cost of living for American families? I think that has been and continues to be the number one concern, particularly for swing voters in this country. And I don't think we frankly have clarity at all, particularly from Vice President Walton and Harris campaign of what they're going to do. And I would like to see Vice, I would see Senator Vance. Um, really double down on President Trump's successes in that area from the last administration, the tax cuts, extending those individual tax cuts, doubling down on cutting regulations, a lot of the things they did in the past, instead of some of this industrial policy, winners and losers things. I'd like to see uh, Vance really understand what Trump did uh, that made the economy so strong in 2019 and do it again. You know, Kosh, sometimes we're tempted to talk about things at a level at which most Americans are not. I just posted that the Israelis are making sure a fillet's gap does not develop in southern Lebanon. And someone said, what the hell is a fillet's gap? And it's, you know, a World War II term from 30 days after the invasion of Normandy. I'm not going to take time here. But if they do ask that question, do they risk getting into the minutia that most Americans' eyes will glaze over? How do you avoid the mego effect? Yeah, no, I think that's a fair concern. But I think you can really simplify this, Hugh, right? I think American people understand that $6 trillion in Democrat overspending drove this inflation crisis. So I think very simply, for example, if Senator Vance can say, we are going to extend your tax cuts, we're going to focus on getting government spending out of control, under control, and we're going to make sure that regulations doesn't make things more expensive and more difficult. I think that's really easy for people to understand because it's been done before. We just did this under the administration a few years ago and have seen the exact opposite 
at play in the Biden administration. I think you can keep that relatively high level and make clear where your priorities are for the American pocketbooks next year and beyond. What do you think about Kamala Harris keeps saying we have to build three million houses. Government does not build a house. Uh, if they do, it's usually wi wi wildly expensive because they don't know how to do it. But they don't really build houses. They impede the building of houses everywhere. Should that come up? Because, of course, our housing shortage is combining with high interest rates to make it very difficult for young people to buy their first home, et cetera. How do you make that known to the viewing audience of your J.D. Vance? Yeah, absolutely. I think this is such an important point. I do think this will come up. And I think, frankly, I think Vice President Waltz is probably going to be the one to bring it up. Um, I think J.D. Vance needs to hammer him on the fact that this administration is in control right now and raising costs that we've discussed here, right? They've raised the cost of inputs. They've raised the cost of lumber. They're right now with this port strike that just began, again, going to raise costs for essential materials. And so housing costs, there are a lot of factors that drive it. But I think this administration, of course, has not helped. You talk, again, about state and local regulations that have been a problem. Um, the one thing I'm hopeful that J.D. Vance won't do, because Hugh, it is not correct. It is not correct to say that the immigration problem is driving housing prices. There is a housing shortage in general. Housing prices are going up in general. Immigration influx and saying that we need fewer people in this country is not the answer to our housing crisis. I think that's something he's done in the past. I'm hopeful he doesn't do that and really stick to pinning the blame on this administration and the failures of Democratic cities and governors and mayors uh, across the country for this crisis in the first place. You know, Akash, I think he might be tempted to say, Jerome Powell, your Federal Reserve chairman, said at his last press conference when interest rates were cut uh, by uh, half of one percentage point that illegal immigration is impacting the labor market. Now, Powell did not say the renter's market or the housing market. He said the labor market. Do you agree with Powell? Uh, I, I do, but I think the point here, especially as it pertains to housing, is actually probably the opposite. We actually saw this take place in Florida um, when there was that big scare a while back where all of a sudden housing construction came to a screeching halt because workers were fleeing their various counties and all that. And frankly, you in some of these counties, the only reason that even got back uh, things kind of got going again was because local sheriffs said they weren't going to enforce that order. And so, look, on net, immigration is very, very important to building houses and keeping the price of housing under control for people. I think interest rates and input costs and all these other things, regulations, as, as we were just discussing, discussing go a lot further uh, in driving the cost of housing for people. Akash, you don't know how right you are, at least in Southern California, where I did most of my legal work. Almost every drywaller in Southern California is a Spanish speaker. And I mean, almost 100%. I'm Hugh Hewitt. Fire in New York joins me, as he does most Tuesdays. The Fox News contributor and Washington Examiner columnist and reporter is always a fun person to talk to on debate day. But first, a quiz, Byron, earlier today. Uh -oh. talking, yeah, it's a, it's a one-question quiz. Earlier today, I was talking about uh, Mike Doran posted a picture. Israel blew up a road from Bekaa Valley down to southern Lebanon and speculated maybe that's to keep reinforcements from coming. I think it's to keep Hezbollah from escaping so that they don't have their own fillets gap. And I got hammered. Uh, what's the fillets gap? Okay. Is that, do you know what the fillets gap is? Uh, I think this is a World War II battle in which uh, the Allies encircled. Uh, a large uh, area of, of Germans. Exactly. July 1944, almost encircled. They left a little gap so that all about 50,000 Wehrmacht got out. And I don't think that the Israelis want any of Hezbollah to get out of southern Lebanon. Uh, I think that's, uh, I think they're taking care of all the family business here. And uh, so, no, they do not want anybody to get out. Now, Byron, my theory on Netanyahu unbound for the last two weeks or two months is that he came to the United States, took the measure of Joe Biden, found he's really a husk, sat down with Kamala Harris, who had snubbed him and decided she's going to be anti-Israel. He got five weeks to finish before America can do things like cut off. They can't dare take action against Israel during the campaign, right? Uh, I don't think so. Um, I was uh, even surprised at uh, what the president said as he was walking out the door uh, when he briefly met the press. Was it yesterday? It's, uh, he he wants, wants them to stop. 
stop. So, I mean, every time Israel, Israel has a military success, the United States' uh, message is stop right now. Um, and look, Israel is a foreign, sovereign nation. It's got its own priorities. It has a plan here. And uh, they're going to do what they're going to do. Byron, this is a very sensitive question, and I want to be respectful of the President of the United States. On the commentary podcast yesterday, they bluntly state, we have a 25th Amendment situation with the President. Yeah. Do you agree? Um, if, if we don't, we're close to it. Uh, I think it's, you know, it, the first thing, it's it's been bizarre uh, since, uh, was it July 21st, when President uh, Biden announced that he wasn't going to run? Um, most of the press corps has just kind of uh, moved on to the campaign as the only story there is. Uh, meanwhile, the world blows up, and the president of the United States seems out of it. And you have to remember that uh, Democrats argued that Joe Biden did not have the physical strength and mental capacity to campaign for president, but they absolutely insisted he had the physical strength and the mental capacity to continue to serve as president of the United States. It really made no sense, and we've had a number of uh, uh, a number of instances, just like we were having, you know, over the summer, of Biden appearing to be completely out of it. And it's got to be an enormous concern because he is still president um, until January 20th, and uh, a lot of bad things can happen between now and then. It is accepted practice for the president of the United States to use an auto pen for things like emergency declarations. So I don't think people in North Carolina, Tennessee, northern Georgia, western Virginia have to worry about FEMA being authorized. But I do think they have to worry about the competence of the federal government. Kamala Harris's visit did nothing to encourage me. What did you think about disaster? Is this their Katrina, Byron York? Well, <clears throat> excuse me. Um, it's kind of a... It, obviously, they they got off. They got a very very slow start on this, and they were they were um, slow to understand the absolute severity of this, and they don't appear to have any um, motivation to actually handle this quickly. And and people are obviously in just as desperate a situation as we saw. During Katrina. Now, during Katrina, there was a lot, which is 2005, I believe, there was a lot of video. There was a lot of helicopter video. There were people on roofs in a, in a city situation. Um, here we have people in desperate situations uh, out in the woods in isolated uh, areas. And um, there, they, there's not the sort of visual um, representation of it that people are seeing every single day. But this administration has been absolutely, um, absolutely slow. To, they're they're flat-footed. They're flat-footed. Now, I'm not going to do what Democrats did to George W. Bush and say he's indifferent to a population. In that case, it was African Americans. In this case, it would be rural America. I just think the federal government is clumsy, too big, and doesn't know what to do, and it's up to governors to act. But I've never seen anything as uh, the equal. But even equal... if you want to be cynical about it, I mean, it is a, a swing state. It's North, Car North Carolina is one of the worst here. And, of course, Georgia was is severely affected as well. Even if you view this cynically, politically, that the only reason they would help is because they want to win the state. Like, well, they should do it. Yeah, they should. I, I, I've got to say, I, I have never seen anything like the picture of the grandparents and the grandchild who died because their roof collapsed and they fell into the water and they were being filmed by the... And I became a grandfather for the sixth time last night, early this morning, and I just can't imagine being those grandparents or that parent. And why there aren't helicopters there, it's North Carolina. They got the entire army to the left, yeah. right? I, if you look at a map, it's in eastern North Carolina. They got to get to western North Carolina. I think, I think the 101st is at North Carolina at Fort... Um, it's no longer, I think it's Fort Liberty now. Uh, but I, I'm confused by that, Byron. Let's talk about the polls. Real clear <laughs> politics average, Harris up two in the national, Trump up yeah. 0.1 in the battleground. Neither of those numbers make any sense because they're margin of error and you can't count on them. That means they're not real numbers. How do you feel about the election right now? Um, you know, if you told me you've got to bet $100 on the election, 
you know, like Fred Barrow's Canada Casino, I, th- I think I might do 50 on each one. I mean, I, I don't, uh, I, I, I think when you see a small Harris lead, I do subscribe to the idea that that does not translate into victory because the national polls are polls of popular vote and Hillary Clinton won the popular vote by, I think it was 2.1% in uh, 2016 and lost the election. Uh, Joe Biden won it by four point something percent um, in 2020 and he won the election. So somewhere in there is the, um, the margin of Democratic victory in the popular vote that translates into an electoral college victory. So I, when I see, you know, she's up by 1.9 or 2.0 or something like that, I, I just think she's probably nervous about that. Uh, and also, maybe the you know, you never know if polling has actually gotten better or if, this, if the same 2016 and 2020 problems apply. Yeah, what I would love to know is what their out. models project turnout to be since the turnout was so extraordinarily high in 2020. Yeah, I, I just don't know what it's going to be, so I don't know how they model it. Byron, we're going to. I want. I want you to stay during the break to talk to me a little bit about the debate. I want to remind everyone the debate is tonight at 9 p.m. Uh, Salem News Channel will start coverage with Larry Elder at seven and continue after the debate 10:30 to I think uh, midnight at least with Andrew Wilco and Jeff Vaughn, and we will be simulcasting with agreement with CBS on the Salem Radio Network the debate uh, tonight. Byron, what is your advice, and we'll carry over into the break for JD Vance tonight. Well, Tim Waltz has a, a real record um, as as governor of Minnesota, and and his time as governor uh, covered two of the most consequential times in recent uh, in our recent era. And one was COVID, and which affected all of us everywhere. Uh, but he was particularly wrong about uh, COVID shutdowns. But the other were the riots in uh, the 2020, the George Floyd riots in um, uh, Minneapolis, and he was particularly, particularly wrong in a way that probably uh, cost lives there. So he has a real record. So the more he wants to talk about how he was a football coach or a teacher, uh, no, he was actually governor of Minnesota during one of the most consequential times, and he did a poor job. And less, uh, I would say much worse than a poor job. He was an absent governor during a crisis. And that's when the governor's got to call up the National Guard. And he rejected appeal after appeal to call up the National Guard. And as a result, large parts of Minnesota are still, uh, uh, the Twin Cities are still unrebuilt. Byron, I wanted to ask you about the moderators. Uh, I've been on with Margaret Brennan. I don't know Nora O'Donnell. I think Margaret is a liberal. I I think Nora O'Donnell's a liberal. I think CBS suffers from the same problem of all legacy media. They've been hiring leftists for a long time, and the kids aren't really even open to center-right arguments, much less conservative ones. So I expect it to be a bad debate, and as bad as the ABC debate. Do you? Well, they have two models. The moderators have two models in front of them. They have the uh, CNN model from the June debate, uh, which proved to be the end of Joe Biden. Uh, and then they have the uh, the ABC model from the September 10th debate in Philadelphia, uh, which should have been an embarrassment, I think, for ABC and for um, uh, maybe mainstream journalism as well. But uh, the problem, of course, with ABC was that they they decided to fact-check in the debate, but they only fact-checked one side. So they decided to fact-check Donald Trump, not fact-check uh, Kamala Harris. I, I think it had a disastrous result. This is not to say that Trump did well in that debate. I don't think he did. But the moderators uh, were, were terrible. So they really have two models in front of them, uh, and they've already said that they're not going to fact-check. Uh, in this debate, which I think is a, a good idea. So they're going to say that Waltz and Vance can fact check each other all they want, uh, but the moderators aren't going to do it. Now, Byron, when we did the debate in November with NBC, Salem partnered with NBC, we spent uh, a month and 12 rehearsals, and it happened after 10 7. So we spent an hour and 15 minutes on national security in Israel. The, the world's on fire. Shouldn't they open up strong on this? Ask them about the IDF in Lebanon. Ask them about Taiwan. Ask them about Ukraine. Uh, you would think so, but I have to say, um, I think most debate moderators, when they when they sit down to plan a debate, think to themselves, "I need to start 
with the issue that voters say is the most important. And that continues to be the economy uh, and the cost, more specifically, the cost of living. So my guess is they're probably going to start with that because just like in September and just like back in June, uh, that's what voters say is most important to them. I assume illegal immigration will come up as well because it's number two. Now, we've had an abortion question in every debate everywhere for the last two years. Do you think there'll be another abortion question tonight? Oh, yeah, absolutely. I mean, that is one of those issues. I mean, if you look number at three, the number top three. issues, we're, we're talking about the economy slash inflation, the border, and abortion. And obviously, it's the issue that um, favors Democrats the most. So, yeah, there's going to be a, uh, an issue about that. And, they're gonna, and that's one of the things they'll want to attack J.D. Vance on. Yeah, this is what drives me crazy. It's been asked and answered by Donald Trump, who said, I like uh, the decision to leave it with the states. J.D. Vance will repeat that. We know what the answer is going to be. I just think it's just bias to bring it back up because it's the, it's the one issue on which Kamala Harris leads Donald Trump. So they've got to get it in. Byron York over at X, follow him as we watch tonight. He'll be hoping, I hope he will tweet a couple of, post a couple of his uh, assessments at X. So I will know what the smart people are thinking inside the Beltway. Thank you, Byron. Thank you, Hugh. Admiral James Stavridis, retired United States Navy, joins me, former Allied Supreme Commander and the author of a brand new novel, The Restless Wave. Admiral, I got to say, in 1971, Herman Woke captured my imagination with the winds of war. In 1978, he had a sequel, War and Remembrance. They're still great books, but I am glad you were doing for this generation what Herman Woke did for mine, which is educate them through story about the stakes and the men and women who fought World War II. Was, was that your intention, just to educate it was very much so. And, uh, you know, Winston Churchill said, the further you want to look into the future, the more you must look into the past. And so as I think about, as you and I've discussed so many times, the possibility of great power war in the Pacific with China today, you know, we don't have to imagine what that would look like. We can go back uh, to the Second World War 80 years ago and look at the war we fought and won with Japan. So absolutely wanted to educate, wanted to shine a light on great power war, also new technology coming into war. And finally, as you've started um, with pointing out that sometimes young men and in today's world, young women have to stand and deliver for their country. That were the, the big themes of the work, The Restless Wave. The Restless Wave is fabulous. And I am I am prejudiced, I have to admit, you know, full disclosure to the audience, a, a character in this novel is the fetching Mrs. Hewitt's uncle, another is her grandfather. Admiral Stav, last night he became a grandfather again for the sixth time. That will be the great, great grandfather of uh, the new baby girl who will be eligible to go to the United States Naval Academy as you did. But the class of 41 had a number of, of significant people in it. And I heard one of the CNOs, John uh, Richardson, say that all of our submarine captains, not all, but many of our submarine captains, skippers, at the start of World War II, were not really ready for the war. Is that going to show up eventually in this? Yeah, very much so in the sequel to The Restless Wave, which uh, begins in 19... 44. So The Restless Wave, the book we're talking about, uh, follows a young man from Key West in the 30s. He decides to go to the Naval Academy, and then he graduates with that storied class of 1941, graduates uh, uh, almost six months early because the Navy knows war is coming. So they land in the Pacific, and not just the submariners, no one was ready for that war. And, uh, of course, the character you're talking about, uh, Joe Tossig, uh, ends up on, in Pearl Harbor and uh, standing on a battleship and, and suffers a grievous wound at the very start of the book. And, and the through line to our submariners is um, they ended up being the most highly blooded portion of the U.S. Navy. We lost 10 percent of them in combat, but boy, did they deliver for the nation once we fixed the torpedoes, got them in the right boats, gave them the tactics, they went to war. I, what I very much appreciate, Admiral, is that you included this story 
of Admiral Tossig, uh, Young Joe's dad, who got cashiered by FDR because they got, as you said, cross threads over Japan. Not many people know that story. I don't know that you you ran the Naval Institute, so of course you know that story. Let me turn now to our current Navy under fire in the Gulf. Yesterday, Americans struck um, militias in Baghdad. Do you expect the pace of response to accelerate as Israel invades Lebanon? Uh, I think the pace of response, particularly to the Houthis down south, um, is going to increase. In other words, um, the global shipping community, I think, is finally arriving at the realization that we can't simply stumble along uh, allowing merchant ships like the one you're showing here uh, to uh, simply be taken down by a bunch of uh, Iranian trained operators. And, and I know many folks are, are on radio with us, but for those who get a chance to watch the YouTube that Hugh just put up, you're seeing the Houthi rebels take down um, a commercial uh, warship. And hey, these are not the Somali pirates of uh, 20 years ago that I fought when I was NATO commander. Those were uh, skinny kids and flip flops with rusty AK 47s. These are Iranian trained uh, Navy SEAL wannabes who are landing on a merchant ship, streaming out of a modern helicopter, completely kitted out, and ruthlessly taking down this uh, huge vessel. We cannot permit that to go on, nor should we. Now, Admiral, I want to turn over to the IDF. Earlier this morning, Michael Duran, who's a pretty good Iran expert, posted a uh, video of Kaqaba, Lebanon, which is north of Marjua Yuan, which I can't say any of these names. They've blown up the roads, and Michael speculated that's to prevent reinforcements coming from Baqa, and I, spons- I responded, they don't want a fillet's gap. They don't want Hezbollah scootering away. What do you think it is, destroying the, the north w- north-south road in Lebanon? I think, uh, once again, you've shown us you're quite a good military strategist. Um, without question, the Israelis are, are going to uh, shut down uh, probably 20 plus miles into Lebanon. And the reason is quite simple. I can, I can tell you the reason in two words. Uh, 7 October, meaning that having witnessed the Hamas terrorists streaming across their borders, raping, murdering, mutilating, kidnapping, Israelis will never permit that to occur again. They're certainly not going to p- permit Hezbollah to do it from the north. To avoid that, they have to create a pretty deep buffer zone, which I think they will ultimately militarize a great part of it. And that'll be somewhere between 15 and 20 miles inland up to the Litani River. That would be the advice I would be giving the Israelis if I were wearing the uniform of the IDF this morning. Now, Admiral, I want to close by asking you to sort of opine on the last two weeks, because there are levels of military efficacy which range from bad to extraordinary off the charts 10. So with poor execution, disastrous results being zero, and 10 being whatever is the most extraordinary, maybe the Osama bin Laden takedown by our special forces in Pakistan. Where do you rate the last two weeks from from getting Hanaya in Tehran to getting the chief of staff and then the Radwan force and then Nasrallah, the beepers, the walkie-talkie, all of it. How do you rate the last two weeks? I'd give them a nine out of 10. And the only reason I wouldn't give them a 10 out of 10 is because of the collateral damage, the civilians killed. And that is always an unfortunate consequence, particularly if you're going after particularly high value targets. But let's, let's be honest here. Let's be real here. The reason there is collateral damage is because these terrorist organizations are using civilians deliberately and ruthlessly as human shields. And uh, therefore, the Israelis who have a military mission to conduct are going after killers who have not only the blood of Israelis on their hands, but also the blood of Americans. So um, I think the last two weeks have been 
extraordinary in terms of pure offensive military efficacy. Uh, secondly, in terms of technological execution, particularly the caper with the beepers. Uh, thirdly, um, where there have been collateral damage, civilians, they've done all they can to minimize it. You can't be perfect in that regard. Uh, and no military operation is ever perfect, but I'd give them a strong nine out of 10. Last question, Admiral. You were serving when the American embassy in Beirut was blown up in April of 1983 and when the Marine Corps barracks was bombed in October of 1983. Jack Carr and James Scott have a new book out, uh, eerily timed for this week, called Targeted Beirut, which goes back through the 1983 operation. They were never avenged. The, 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 the Marines and the diplomats who were killed and the CIA people that were killed in those two attacks were never avenged. Cap Weinberger pulled everybody out, recommended Reagan. I didn't get to the Reagan administration until 85, but I was talking with a alumni yesterday. That was, that was quite the screw up and disaster. Do you think Marines were enjoying this weekend perhaps a little bit more than other Americans? Yes, they were, and so were uh, members of the class of 1976 from the U.S. Naval Academy. That would be my class. Um, our first classmate who died in combat on active duty, Captain Vince Smith, I'll say his name again, Captain Vince Smith died in that barracks bombing. I knew him well at Annapolis. Rest in peace, classmate. That is... That's a punctuation that I cannot improve on. I'm, I hope you enjoy targeted Beirut as much as I'm enjoying the restless wave. Admiral Stavridis, good to talk to you as always. Look forward to talking to you when the book drops. I don't want to give any more away about the restless wave other than you ought to go and order it right now at Amazon because it's, it's going to go out of print and then it's going to have to get reprinted and you're going to have to wait unless you have a pre-order in. So go and get it, the restless wave. Uh, Herman Woke really it became a miniseries, and I'm here to tell Hollywood, to my friends in Hollywood, go option The Restless Wave. Uh, I don't know that the Admiral intended to build it into a streaming miniseries. The first successful miniseries, in my view, was The Winds of War and War and Remembrance. The most least successful uh, miniseries of my youth was Shogun. It's terrible. So they've redone Shogun, and it's pretty good. I don't want him to redo The Winds of War. Everybody knows how that story ends, and everybody saw that series. The Restless Wave is a new story, a new plot line with new characters in new places, and it's got, got big guns in it, big, big guns, battleship guns, at least at the beginning. And the plebes and the upperclassmen at the class of 1941 in Annapolis, expertly described by a man who lived there, did not know that the Admiral lost a classmate in Beirut. Wish I'd known that when I talked to Jack Carr and James Scott yesterday. Their book is targeted Beirut, but the Admiral's new book is The Restless Wave. I'm joined by Olivia Beavers of Politico. Olivia, good morning. I, this is an unfair question to pop on you. Do you know what the CR does in terms of aid to Israel? Because we did spend a lot on Israel, but I think it was a special uh, appropriation that would not be covered by the CR. I, I really don't know. Um, I, off the top of my head, I don't know, but my understanding is that it's clean funding levels and they did pass a separate Israel spending bill. So I don't know if this would change anything more than the status quo of whatever money we have built into giving Israel for their defense. And the same would apply to Ukraine aid that that no, that was a separate bill. The CR would not extend Ukraine or Israeli military aid that we have been providing. That would be my understanding, but I... I, uh, that's more what I leave to have our policy reporters help me with when, I, when they're okay. digging into the, the details. So I'm going to throw my hands up on this one, but. Uh, Let me ask you about you James are... Comer and Tim Walls. Yesterday, James Comer sent a letter about Tim Walls going to China and not going to China. Does that have any legs on it? I, I mean, Jim Comer doesn't have any hearings scheduled, does he? He just sends a letter. He just sent a letter, and I don't know if we're going to be seeing him um, being called back to testify, but uh, there have been other sort of moments where Republicans have circled um, Tim Walz and his China ties. There was, I think, um, a, uh, what is it, a Chinese, 
I'm, I'm not going to get the name of the type of company correct, but there was a, a Chinese development company that they had concerns about that Tim Walls, they were trying to allege, had ties to. But I don't know how, I, I don't, it didn't seem like particularly tight ties and Republicans were trying to narrow in on that as a way of going after Walls. But I had no doubt that China might be a question that, or a point that Vance might try to make at Walls during the debate. Yeah, I, China did not come up in the first debate. I, have, I mm -hmm. speculate it's because Disney owns ABC and was not about to imperil its relationship with two theme parks in, in China. However, the letter says you went X number of times. Wall says 30. Yep. It seems like he went 15. But Walls also said he was there for the Tiananmen Square Massacre. And evidence surfaced. Yeah, he wasn't. I mean, does this matter to the Beltway media at all that he's kind of a serial fabulist? It, I mean, definitely. And reporters should be calling um, any candidate who is running out on any kind of fabrication. Um, I, you know, there's there's moments where I think reporters sometimes don't hit hard enough and they get criticized for it. And that's fair criticism. Um, but, uh, you know, I think that it's our job to be making sure we call out when there's there's no evidence to back up some of these claims. And um you know, one of the sort of other ones that we saw where Tim Walls was sort of caught in this kind of moment was his military record. And um, there were stories written about it. I remember my colleagues and I going around and asking about it. Um, and that's also, I think, something that he's going to be pressed on when he's on the debate stage. And J.D. Vance is also a veteran. So we're going to probably see um, a moment, uh, I imagine, of Vance whacking him on that. Well, I hope they spend time talking about Eastern Tennessee, Western North Carolina, Northern Georgia, and Western Virginia. What is the buzz in Politico newsroom about that? Because you weren't around when Katrina happened, and it was 24-7 mm -hmm. uh, coverage of the failures of the Bush administration on Katrina and in New Orleans. I don't see the same level of focus. Is that actually part of the Politico coverage this morning? I think that there's... A, a, quite a few stories out and they're talking about the politics of um, natural disasters. And, you know, I know the Trump campaign has been hitting on Biden for um, not being in DC while the storm hit, but um, President Biden has hit back arguing that he's been on the phone the whole time. He's been trying to coordinate things and he'll be going down to North Carolina, I think tomorrow. Um, disaster relief tends to play you know, it's a great moment for voters to see how leaders might respond. Um, Kamala Harris cut her Southwest trip short to go back to D.C. to try to respond to this. And you're seeing Biden talking about getting more funding for disaster relief. Um, there was not funding included in the CR. It was originally proposed um, at a number that was lower than what I think the White House has been asking, but at $10 billion. Um, I don't know if they're actually going to call them back during uh, so close to the election um, to try to pass disaster relief, but that might be a motion that Biden might make uh, as a way of trying to help Harris kind of get some, you know. 30 use. seconds. Has anyone asked how NOAA failed here? National Oceanographic Administration gave no warning that this would be this way. Uh, everyone, literally, uh, what Katrina, everyone knew was coming and made a sharp left turn. That's why it surprised people. But everybody knew this was coming. If Big Ben was ready, Florida evacuated. Anyone covering NOAA and not predicting what the rains would be? Uh, I haven't heard that, but I have, I'm sure that that's the question that's being asked. That's not really my specialty area, but I imagine that like some of the energy and environment reporters are digging into why this is not. Um, yeah, it's just a failure of the predictive model about. completely, and I'm sure it's unintentional, but boy, what a fail. Israel is advancing its forces into southern Lebanon, and the IDF has issued new restrictions for Tel Aviv and Jerusalem after rocket fire on central Israel. Join me to discuss all these developments is Dr. Michael L. Warren. He's back in the States. He was Israel's ambassador to the United States for many years. He's back in the States, no doubt, for Hot Zala or somebody. What brings you to the United States at this critical juncture, Dr. Warren? Defending the state of Israel, Hugh. Well done. You know? That's important to do. <laughs> I have been defending no, this operation all morning. I'm a veteran of the first and second Lebanon wars. Um, and this war is going to see me in a different uniform, the ones you're seeing me in now. Well, the paratroopers, of which you are an alum, 
led the way, the 98th Battalion uh, Division. What do you expect is the war goal of the Lebanon ground operation? Let's see. What, what's different from the first and second Lebanon war? I mean, both of those wars were taken because uh, Lebanon was taken over by terrorists in 1882 by Palestinian terrorists in 2006 by Hezbollah terrorists. Uh, and in both cases, uh, the terrorists were were attacking our forces along the northern border and Israel moved to defend itself. And I, I hope we learned some of the lessons of the first two wars, neither of which were, were successful. And that is you go into Lebanon and it's very, very difficult to get out. And you're fighting in, in immensely hostile terrain. It, it's not your home court, it's their home court. Uh, and it's one thing to bomb uh, Hezbollah or the Palestinians in the air. It's another to, you know, to get into a, an armored personnel carrier or simply walk in and, and fight, uh, you know, ridge to ridge, mountain to mountain, uh, village to village is a whole different story. Um, here, the goals are much more limited. In 1982, we went all the way to Beirut. Uh, in 2006, we went, oh, maybe 10, 20 miles inside uh, Lebanon. But here, the, the initial goal is to clear the ridge overlooking Israel's northern uh, border. If, you, if you're sitting on one of the border communities like Matula, you're looking up at Lebanese villages. If you're in Matula, you're looking up at the Lebanese villages of Kila and El Khiam. That's precisely where Israel is operating this morning because from those villages, Hezbollah has been shooting flat trajectory anti-tank missiles. That's hard to say this time in the morning. Flat trajectory anti-tank missiles for which we have no defense. Uh, their Iron Dome is useless against those those rockets, and they've been those rockets have been killing Israelis and destroying houses. So to clear out that ridge, that is certainly the the main and I hope maybe the, the principal objective uh, of this operation. Uh, Ambassador Oren, what about the tunnels? Gaza tunnels are being methodically destroyed, and the victory over Hamas is nearly complete, save for the return of 101 hostages, uh, and confirmation or capture of um, Sinwar. What is, what is the objective about the tunnels here? Well, the tunnels, first, as we said, are different tunnels. Uh, the tunnels in Gaza were, you know, were forged and dug out of sand. Um, and you could, you could find them. You could uh, destroy them relatively easy. The tunnels that Hezbollah digs, remember, Hezbollah was the, was the organization that taught Hamas how to dig tunnels. Those tunnels are digger, and they're, and they're cut out of rock. And they're harder to destroy, harder to detect. Uh, and we have to put down the assumption that there are still attack tunnels even under the northern border. I recently brought a delegation of displaced, displaced Israelis to Washington, D.C., and all of them believe that there are still tunnels under the border. So there's another objective to certainly, certainly locate these tunnels and to the best of our ability to destroy them. Now, Ambassador Oren, last night I listened to the new commentary pod. Dan Senor joined our regular friends at Commentary. It was almost celebratory. Uh, given the last two weeks in Israel. And this morning, Admiral Stavridis, retired United States Navy Allied Supreme Commander, I'm sure a friend of yours, is yes, thankful sir. for the IDF for avenging his classmate from the United States Naval Academy class of 1976 who was murdered by Hezbollah's forerunners in 1983 in the Marine Corps barracks bombing. How do you feel this morning about the, the last two weeks in Israel? Cautiously uh, optimistic. Uh, and certainly proud, but also um, I'm resisting the urge to be too jubilant, and I'll explain why. Yes, Israel has restored its deterrence power. Israel has shown the world how to fight back against terror. Uh, I hope it's shown the United States how to fight against terror, and the United States will stand with us, because this is an historic opportunity which cannot and must not be missed. Uh, however, uh, for all of the degrading we have done to Hezbollah, uh, we've decapitated its leadership, we've taken out maybe thousands of rockets, Hezbollah remains a formidable, formidable military force. And Hezbollah has not used its accurate rockets yet, it has highly accurate rockets. We haven't faced rockets from Iran yet. We haven't faced an overwhelming number of rockets, uh, both from Yemen and the pro-Iranian militias in Iraq and Syria. Um, this, you know, in the Churchillian sense, this is maybe not even the, the end of the beginning uh, of this war. And we've seen that Hezbollah can still strike Israel, can strike Israel in central Israel, it can strike, uh, it can strike Jerusalem. Uh, and we must resist the urge to be over jubilant. The goal in Lebanon is different than the goal in Gaza. The goal in Gaza was twofold, to destroy Hamas and to secure the release of the hostages. There are no hostages in the hands of Hezbollah. And I don't, and I don't think we can actually destroy Hezbollah. What we can do is drive Hezbollah north of the Latani River uh, in accordance with uh, UN Resolution uh, 1701 of 2006, 
and we can deter Hezbollah and deter also Iran to the degree that Iran will no longer threaten us to the same degree and Iran will no threaten our neighbors to the same degree. Uh, Ambassador Oren, do you believe that Iran is deterred now that they do not expect America to be able to tell Israel not to respond, as it did after the April attack when Joe Biden told him, Prime Minister Netanyahu to, quote, take the win. Israel did something. We're not quite sure what they did, but it wasn't massive. Do you think Iran expects a massive response if they join this fray? Uh, they'd be foolish if they didn't. <laughs> they'd be sure if they didn't. And the Supreme Leader is now hiding as Hassan Nasrallah uh, once hit. And you saw how well that worked out for Hassan Nasrallah. Um, this is an historic opportunity. That's all I can say, uh, Hugh. An historical opportunity for Israel, but particularly for the United States. You know, I was in the White House with this uh, this delegation just over a week and a half ago, and I asked very pointedly uh, the president and vice president's uh, security advisors, are the military assets that the United States has moved into the Middle East, and they are significant assets indeed, are they in strictly a defensive posture, or they also have offensive capabilities? And the answer I got then was defensive. They're there to help defend the state of Israel, and that is the line that has been used by, by the White House, by the Pentagon ever since. That is great if they help Israel take down rockets if we're overwhelmed by swarms of, of missiles and drones. Um, that's all very much welcomed, as it was on April 14th. Uh, but he, that, that is not going to be a win. You don't win only by, on defense, do you? You don't win a football game. You don't win a soccer game. You don't win a basketball game. Only on defense. You have to go on the offense. And here, the, the stakes are historic, simply historic. Here's an opportunity for the United States to change the entire balance of power, uh, both in the Middle East, but in the world. Uh, Russia is not in a position to come and help Iran. Iran's, Russia's bogged down in Ukraine. Iran is behind 99.9% of all the violence in the Middle East, and not just in the Middle East. Uh, here's an opportunity to humble Iran, create a situation where the people of Iran will sense that the Ayatollahs are weak, and, uh, and very perhaps those people could rise up and make a sea change that will greatly, vastly redound to the benefit of the United States, Israel, and all the people of the Middle East. Let me ask you, uh, Ambassador Oren, whether or not Syria is expecting to get hit by Israel as well if they allow the militias operating and the IRGC operating in Syria to shoot at Israel, as they have been doing uh, periodically since 10-7 of last year? Uh, Israel will, um, will defend itself against anybody who shoots at us. <laughs> anybody. Whether it's the, it's the Houthi rebels in Yemen uh, or the militias in Iraq and Syria, certainly, certainly, the Syrian army, certainly. Um, everybody is on notice. Um, we are an aroused democracy in the true way that uh, Dwight Eisenhower talked about it. And uh, look at what happened in Yemen. Uh, you know, Israeli jets flew down to Yemen. That's further than the, the, the ports of Yemen are further away than the, the nuclear installations in Iran. And I, I notice that, you know, we don't have strategic bombers. We don't have B-1s, B-2s. We have these little planes called F-15s, 16s, and F-35s, which have limited uh, payloads and, and certainly limited range. But with inter-air refueling, you can see what they can do. Um, we didn't have strategic bombers, but the use of these small bombers operating in very close uh, tandem, uh, were able to penetrate 60 feet of bunker and to kill Hassan, Hassan Nasrallah. But to me, that's an unequivocal message to the people in Tehran. Dr. Warren, I wanted to ask you a question that I posed to my friend John Podhoritz yesterday. Could only Benjamin Netanyahu, with his three plus decades of experience, have successfully navigated the shoals of the last month? I know there are critics of Netanyahu more than there are critics of Trump and Biden and Harris combined, because he's been around for so long. But maybe like Churchill having served forever in every war from the Boer War forward was prepared for World War II, maybe 30 years prepared Netanyahu for the last two weeks. What do you think? I think that uh, you can fault Benjamin Netanyahu for, um, Netanyahu for many things. Um, his role on October 7th, uh, his role in the judicial crises that uh, sent the message of weakness uh, to our enemies before October 7th, um, many of his messaging. I think that his handling of this international situation, uh, certainly over the last month, uh, has something that uh, historians will study for a very long time. Uh, you have an administration which is 
uh, in its public messaging, certainly, is all the time qualifying its support for Israel. Uh, we support Israel's right to exist. We support Israel's right to defend itself. But, but Israel, how it defends itself uh, uh, matters. But there has to be a Palestinian state. But, uh, you know, Palestinians have to live in security and dignity. A lot of buts and a lot of these buts are simply not attainable. Uh, so the message in the, to the world is one of very highly qualified support for Israel's right to defend itself. Um, also dealing with, uh, you know, serious uh, deficiencies and shortages of, uh, of munitions. Uh, so on that level, uh, he has handled and navigated this uh, quite well. Um, maybe another Israeli politician um, would have given permission for the, the operations as they're standing now. I don't doubt that. But the navigating of a very, very uh, complex uh, relationship uh, with the United States, our crucial ally at this time, I think will be studied for a long time as a as a work of, of political diplomatic art on the part of Benjamin Netanyahu. I agree with that, and particularly when the guys on commentary commented, and, and Christine Rosen, I shouldn't say guys, on his delivering his General Assembly speech with knowledge that at that moment the IDF was scrambling the Israeli Air Force to destroy Nasrallah. I, I'm just amazed that he could give that speech. Last word to you, uh, Dr. Warren. That, that's a moment that will be studied for a long time in misdirection. Certainly, and the people who are, are critical of him should look back to some of the another person for whom they were not critical, and that was Barack Obama, who did something very similar in 2011 when he gave the speech at the, uh, at the, uh, the Washington ah. Correspondence Center, knowing that SEAL Team 6 was taking out uh, Osama bin Laden. You like that comparison, Hugh? Uh, I do, and it's the first time I've heard it, and it's so apt, I'm going to steal it in the next segment. <laughs> I'm yeah, going to so give you credit, though. Now ask them if they, ask them they're going to criticize Barack Obama, too. <laughs> Dr. Michael Oren, thank you. Always a pleasure. Thank you for the update. And um, I think that everyone listening is as cheered as you are, as I am, uh, but also cautious about what could cautious. happen next. Those young men and women in the field are facing real bullets and real rockets. Thank you, Michael Oren. The Hugh Hewitt Show on the Salem Radio Network returns from break in 45 seconds. show on the Salem Radio Network returns from break in 15 seconds. The Hugh Hewitt Show returns from break in five seconds. Welcome back, America. Dr. Michael Oren remains with me. Dr. Oren, I wanted to ask you a question that I posed to my friend John Podhoritz yesterday. Could only Benjamin Netanyahu, with his three-plus decades of experience, have successfully navigated the shoals of the last month? I know there are critics of Netanyahu more than there are critics of Trump and Biden and Harris combined because he's been around for so long. But maybe like Churchill, having served forever in every war from the Boer War forward, was prepared for World War II, Maybe 30 years prepared Netanyahu for the last two weeks. What do you think? I think that uh, you can fault to Benjamin Netanyahu for, uh, Netanyahu for many things. Um, his role on October 7th, uh, his role in the judicial crises that uh, sent the message of weakness uh, to our enemies before October 7th. Um, many of his messaging, I think that his handling of this international situation uh, certainly over the last month, uh, has something that uh, historians will study for a very long time. Uh, you have an administration which is, uh, in its public messaging, certainly, is all the time qualifying its support for Israel. Uh, we support Israel's right to exist. We support Israel's right to defend itself. But, 
but Israel, how it defends itself uh, uh, matters, but there has to be a Palestinian state, but, uh, you know, Palestinians have to live in security and dignity. A lot of buts, and a lot of these buts are simply not attainable. Uh, so the message in the, to the world is one of very highly qualified support for Israel's right to defend itself. Um, also dealing with uh, you know, serious uh, deficiencies and shortages of, uh, of munitions. Uh, so on that level, uh, he has handled and navigated this uh, quite well. Um, maybe another Israeli politician um, would have given permission for the, the operations as they're standing now. I don't doubt that. But the navigating of a very, very uh, complex uh, relationship uh, with the United States, our crucial ally at this time, I think will be studied for a long time as a as a work of, of political and diplomatic art on the part of Benjamin Netanyahu. I agree with that, and particularly when the guys on commentary commented, and, and Christine Rosen, I shouldn't say guys, on his delivering his General Assembly speech with knowledge that at that moment the IDF was scrambling the Israeli Air Force to destroy Nasrallah. I, I'm just amazed that he could give that speech. Last word to you, uh, Dr. Warren. That, that's a moment that will be studied for a long time in misdirection. Certainly, and the people who are, are critical of him should look back to some of the people, another person for whom they were not critical, and that was Barack Obama, who did something very similar in 2011 when he gave the speech at the, uh, at the, uh, the Washington ah. Correspondence Center, knowing that SEAL Team 6 was taking out uh, Osama bin Laden. You like that comparison, Hugh? Uh, I do, and it's the story. first time I've heard it, and it's so apt. I'm going right to steal it in the next segment. <laughs> I'm <laughs> yeah, going to so give you credit, though. Now ask me if they're they going to criticize Barack Obama, too. <laughs> Dr. Michael Oren, thank you. Always a pleasure. Thank you for the update. And um, I think that everyone listening is as cheered as you are, as I am, uh, but also cautious about what could cautious. happen next. Those Young, very cautious. I, I do want to thank Senator uh, Ambassador Orrin coming up, Senator Tom Cotton. After that, Ambassador David Friedman, whose brand new book, One Jewish State, is really a remarkable read. That's all right ahead. Let me remind you, andrewandtodd.com, andrewandtodd.com, 888 If your life requires you to buy a house right now, it's a difficult mortgage environment to navigate. You want pros. You want a lender. Sierra Pacific Mortgage is a bank. Andrew and Todd.com work for Sierra Pacific Mortgage. Actually, they work for themselves as well. They are my lender, Dwayne's lender, the lender of thousands of listeners to the Hugh Hewitt Show, from whom I have never had a complaint in the decade that they have been our sponsor. Call them at 888-888-1172. 888-888-1172. Don't forget as well... There are the pictures of Andrew and Todd. If you're watching on the Salem News Channel, you can also see my Relief Factor bag. I took it in hour one. I remind you in hours two and three, don't leave home without it. Stop at the coffee pot, stop, or put it in your car if you've got a long commute. If you're working out this morning and you've got some minor aches and pains, say to yourself, I need my relieffactor.com. I may not work out today because I was up all night repeatedly checking the, the text because I became a grandfather again last night, brand new. Uh, grandbaby for the Fetching Mrs. Hewitt and I, number six. And it was a, uh, a long labor for my daughter-in-law. She did great. She looks great. A mother and daughter and son and are all doing fine and we're very, very happy. No sleep for the weary last night, though, or the people who are pensive. You know that. Relief factor does not help that. But if I do manage to get some exercise in this afternoon, it will help that. And it will help every one of you out there who are going to lift weights, go to the gym, whatever you do. Uh, what you want to do is call 1-800-4-RELIEF, 1-800-4-RELIEF. Ask for the 1995 starter pack for three weeks. Or go right now to relieffactor.com, relieffactor.com. Senator Tom Cotton is next on The Hugh Hewitt Show. Portions of The Hugh Hewitt Show brought to you by Sierra Pacific Mortgage. For more info, call 888-888-1172. Last hour, Admiral Stavridis reminded me that he had a classmate blown up by Hezbollah in Beirut, Captain Vincent Smith, in 1983. There's a new book out by Jack Carr and James Scott called Targeted Beirut, which reminds us all about the events of 1983. What did you hear upon, what did you feel upon hearing that Hezbollah's leadership had been uh, assassinated by Israel in the bombing of their underground bunker over the weekend? Well, it's fantastic news, Hugh, that all Americans should celebrate and thank Israel, um, not just for bringing a measure of justice 
to all those Americans, um, most notably the Marines in the Beirut barracks bombing of 1983, but many other Americans who've been wounded or killed or lost loved ones at the hands of Hezbollah, but also for the ongoing threat that Hezbollah poses today, not only to Israel, but to our interests in the region. Um, that's not what Joe Biden and Kamala Harris have done. Sure, they put out some platitudes about what a bad guy Nasrallah was, but then immediately started making demands that Israel enter ceasefire negotiations again with bloodthirsty terrorist groups. In, in reality, Hugh, we should again be thanking Israel, backing them to the hilt, and encouraging them to destroy Hezbollah and Hamas completely. They've apparently made the decision, to borrow from the Godfather, to settle all the family business at once. And that's Senator exactly Cotton, you remind me, though, that when terrorist cells are cut off from command and control, and for years we've known there are Hezbollah terrorists in the United States, and we've suspected that, they're all, their command and control is completely decimated. It was destroyed by the beepers, by the walkie-talkies, by the bombings of the Radwan leadership, by the bombings of the bunker, and then subsequent assassinations in the last two days. Are you worried that we now have free agents, free of any kind of discipline, and basically free agents in the United States? Well, well Hugh, it is a fact that Hezbollah has tried to set up cells with Iran's help throughout the Western world. Um, I also have to to wonder, though, if those cells are having second thoughts about what they've been told all along, because I think there's a lot of second thoughts throughout the region. R remember, Barack Obama and Joe Biden and Kamala Harris and all the smarties in the Democratic foreign policy set and in Europe have told us for years that Iran is fearsome, it has a ring of fire around Israel, you know, it can destroy downtown Tel Aviv. Iran has been totally exposed. Israel has destroyed Hamas's infrastructure and is mopping up its leadership. Israel has decapitated Hezbollah and is now going into Lebanon to clear out Hezbollah. Where is Iran's response? Where are the hundreds of thousands of rockets and mortars being fired? People around the Middle East who are afraid of Iran, who are counting on Iran's uh, support, are now looking at Iran as a weak and feckless threat. Israel, once again, has shown itself to be the strong horse. And that's why the United States should back Israel to the hilt. Again, it can't be overstated what a huge strategic victory it is to destroy Hezbollah, which was Iran's main deterrent. We should also destroy Iran's rebel army in Yemen, after which point Iran will be totally exposed with no defenses on its, fl on its flanks for the first time in decades. Now, I believe that Bashar Assad's brother has also been assassinated in Syria because Syria made the mistake of sending rockets into Israel. I am curious, Senator, do you expect the new Senate, and I know you've been out there with Dave McCormick and Bernie Marino and Tim Sheehy and probably Nella Domenici, who knows where you've been, do you expect the new Senate to vote aid to Israel? Because that country is really stretched beyond its limits in terms of both the financial strain on its economy and on the, the munitions that we've supplied them and have been slow walking under Joe Biden and Kamala Harris. Yeah, that, Hugh, there's no question that a new Republican-led Senate will back Israel strongly, unlike Chuck Schumer's Senate. Chuck Schumer called for new elections in Israel because he's catering to the anti-Semitic wing in his party that doesn't like Benjamin Netanyahu. I frankly would like to call for new elections in New York to get rid of Chuck Schumer. Huh. But that will <laughs> stop. That will stop whenever we're in charge of the Senate. There are still a handful of Democrats that will vote for aid as well. So we'll have more than enough votes to, to make sure that we back Israel to the hilt. They won't be able to hide behind Chuck Schumer and Joe Biden refusing to bring these bills to the floor to vote on it. And it's not just aid, military aid, either, Hugh. It's providing Israel the moral, political, and diplomatic support it needs. The House of Representatives passed with some meager Democratic support in an effort to sanction the International Criminal Court, also known as the International Kangaroo Court, who's been targeting Israel for years. Chuck Schumer refuses to bring it to the floor because, again, the Democratic Party has a large and growing anti-Semitic wing in its ranks. Now, Senator Cotton, coming up after you, former Ambassador David Friedman is joining me to talk about his brand new book, One Jewish State, in which he makes the argument, good trial lawyer, David Friedman's a heck of a trial lawyer, makes the argument for uh, Israel extending sovereignty over Judea and Samaria. I don't expect a, a statement from you about that, but I'm curious if you think Israel has 
confounded sea legs. I'm just so extraordinarily impressed by Netanyahu in the last three weeks, the way he's threaded this very, very difficult situation and gave that speech at the UN, even as the bombers were in the air for Beirut. I, I just don't think we have a comparison. Dr. Warren said Obama went into the White House Correspondents Association as president when we were you know, executing Osama bin Laden raid. It is a remarkable run for Netanyahu over three weeks. Do you agree? It, it is. Tremendous leadership from one of the great statesmen of recent times. Um, also want to stress, though, Hugh, it, it's not just Benjamin Netanyahu. Mm -hmm. it, it's all of the Israeli government, and frankly, all of Israel, strongly united. Whatever other domestic controversies may royal Israeli politics, as they often do, behind the prime minister's war strategy to destroy Hamas and now to destroy Hezbollah. Um, that's, again, something that Joe Biden and Kamala Harris always admit. They, it may be controversial in the Democratic Party in America. It's not controversial in Israel that Israel can't live with a terror statelet on its border, aiming thousands of rockets and missiles at its people, displacing 80,000 Israelis for more than a year from the north. Now, Senator Cotter, I want to turn to domestic politics. We have the debate tonight. Uh, your colleague, J.D. Vance from Ohio, will be on stage with Governor Walz and Margaret Brennan of Face the Nation and Nora O'Donnell of CBS Evening News are both liberals. You have met with both of them. I wonder if you were surprised. You had Robert Costa sitting in for Margaret Brennan on Face the Nation. Were you a little bit stunned that you actually got through a few answers without being interrupted by the host? <laughs> uh, no, he has fine. Uh, the host can try to have, as you often say, a debate as, as opposed to an interview. Um, what I'm confident of is that J.D. Vance is going to do an excellent job of exposing that Kamala Harris is a dangerous San Francisco liberal and that Tim Waltz wants to make Minnesota California. And he's gone a long way towards that, if you know anyone in Minnesota. And that's what they do to America as well. Of course, J.D. also has a big advantage over Tim Waltz in this debate, which is he knows where he stands and what he believes. Maybe even more important, he knows where the boss stands and what he believes. Tim Waltz is almost as absent from the news as Kamala Harris because he can't go out and answer any question. Kamala Harris wants to ban fracking. She's wanted to for 50 years of her life, and now all of a sudden she's had an election eve, eve conversion. She won't say where she stands on race-based reparations. She you know, won't say where she stands on the gas-powered vehicle ban and the electric vehicle mandate. How is Tim Waltz going to answer these questions tonight? He has no idea what Kamala Harris is going to say next in her craven and opportunistic efforts to get herself elected. The Free Beacon has a story yesterday on Governor Walz's trips to China, including one he didn't make. He claimed to have been in Hong Kong at the Tiananmen Square massacre. He wasn't. He was. I mean, they, they've got the goods on him. He seems to be a serial fabulist, uh, Senator Cotton. I'm not sure they're going to bring that up at all tonight because it is left-leaning moderators. Do you expect that to come up tonight, Tim Walls in China? Well, Hugh, as you pointed out, it's very notable that in the ABC presidential debate, the moderators didn't ask a single question about China. Now, I think we should point out, as you have, that ABC is owned by Disney, which has theme parks inside China and which needs access to China's very large domestic movie market. CBS is affiliated with Paramount. The same exact situation with CBS. In fact, every oh, I hadn't thought about major, that. You're right. Every major news net, every major news network and network in America, except for Fox, is owned by or affiliated with a major movie studio that kowtows to kowtows to Chinese communists. So, no, I wouldn't expect CBS moderators to bring that up. I, I bet JD Vance will because Tim Waltz has a 35-year history of entanglement with the Chinese Communist Party to include financial enrichment. And lo and behold, Tim Waltz has been notoriously soft on Chinese communism for years. I am very confident that J.D. Vance will point out his soft on communism record, just like Kamala Harris is soft on communism. Last question, Senator. I have been urging people to go to the Salvation Army or Team Rubicon or any group that's operating relief efforts in North Carolina, Tennessee, and Georgia. Did Arkansas, was it spared by the hurricane, or is it also suffering? No, the uh, Helene tracked far enough to the east uh, that we didn't get much effect from it. But, man, the devastation in parts of Georgia and Tennessee and North Carolina in particular is just terrible. So your heart goes out for all those folks. You know, we, we got some steep and narrow uh, valleys and ravines in the Ozarks that I can only imagine 
what the devastation would be there if you got that level of rain. And I think that's what happened in those Appalachian valleys. Um, so, Are you I'm surprised, Senator, that we didn't get a warning? I mean, if this was Katrina and Bush, we'd be hearing all about this, but we're not. And I don't want to second guess scientists. Maybe it's impossible. But this does seem like flat-footedness on FEMA and NOAA's part. Yeah, I mean, right now, I mean, the focus has to be on restoring services in, in these valleys. Again, some of them uh, are still cut off in terms of cell service, uh, access to roads that have been washed out. Um, we really have to focus on, on getting the aid that we need to those uh, people. But uh, I, I do think there's going to have to be an after action review, as they'd say, in the military, uh, because, again, the, when you're looking at these narrow and, and very deep valleys and ravines, um, some of which we have, again, in the Ozarks, uh, if you get the level of rain they have received, um, it, it could be very dangerous. Um, and I, I think that's unfortunately what you've seen uh, Senator, over in the southeast. Yeah. I, I, I repeat, people can help with the Salvation Army or at Team Re- Rubicon. And I thank you, Senator Cotton, for joining me this morning. Honored to now welcome Ambassador David Friedman, America's uh, most recent ambassador to Israel under Donald Trump, to talk about his book, One Jewish State. Ambassador Friedman, you know, we had a little trouble getting the book to me, and I'm glad that was providential because you're here the morning of Israel's incursion into Lebanon, which is really going after what you call the head of the snake towards the end of one Jewish state. Before we turn to the particulars of the argument that you lay out for sovereignty over of Israel over Judea and Samaria, would you tell me what your reaction is this morning to news that the 98th Division has led the way into Lebanon? Well, look, uh, you know, it's about time, and, um, and I pray for the safety of, the, uh, of these brave soldiers. Uh, they, have to clear, they have to clear some territory uh, on the border there. It's very, very dangerous for the people that live in northern Israel. As you know, they've been, they've been evacuated from their homes for almost a year now, just coming up on a year. Refugees in their own country, 60,000 Israeli citizens have been, uh, have, have been evacuated. They have to come home or else it's just a a huge territorial victory for Hezbollah. So in order for that area to become safe, there needs to be a buffer zone. The buffer zone needs to be cleared out. It can't be done any any other way but by ground. Um, I I don't think Israel wants a long-term ground invasion into Lebanon, um, but they need to clear out at least, you know, 10 kilometers of space. So far, what I'm hearing, there's been minimal resistance. I hope that I hope that continues. You know, as you know, Israel has done some incredible damage to Hezbollah's command and control. They've decapitated most of the leadership there. So we're seeing, fortunately, what at least, you know, so far is, is not a overwhelming response from Hezbollah. And we hope that that continues. They can clear out the territory and they can, you know, bring these poor people back into their homes in the north. Ambassador Friedman, it is very clear in one Jewish state. I read the first three chapters and then listened to the rest of the book because I, I realized I didn't know you were a trial lawyer. I thought you were a corporate lawyer. And then I realized this is a trial lawyer making a closing argument. And then you called your last chapter the closing argument. So I was listening to it with great interest. But at the same time, you stayed out of internal domestic Israeli politics, as I do, because I'm just not smart enough to get involved. I nevertheless have to ask you, could anyone other than Bibi Netanyahu have navigated the last month in Israel's position in the world from the General Assembly through the assassination of Hania in Iran, through the attack on the Radawan forces, to the Nasrallah uh, operation, right through the... I mean, it really requires his three decades of experience to lead right now. Well, it, it's, it's all of that. <clears throat> and also, it's, the, um, it's managing the interference from America, which, uh, which, you know, let's not underestimate. I mean, it, it, a lot of it is, you know, under the surface, uh, doesn't get reported because... The Americans don't want to have this reported in an election season, but but the pressure on Israel not to do any of these things, beginning with the uh, entry into Rafah in uh, in Gaza, but continuing through all these uh, events, as you point out, uh, the pressure was enormous. So the combination of managing uh, the relationship with America, which is an incredibly important strategic asset for Israel, it's its most important strategic asset, and making sure the world doesn't see massive daylight between the two countries, because that only empowers Israel's enemies. So managing that, which I don't think anybody could have done, to the um, step-by-step decapitation of, of Hezbollah, uh, uh, the, the degradation of Hamas's capabilities, these targeted uh, assassinations. Of course, you know, we, we should give credit to these incredible, you know, spies and engineers who managed to 
you know, do all these incredible things that, you know, we haven't seen in the history of warfare. But yeah, but I mean, BB gets enormous credit for this and, and, and well, deservedly so. Now I want to turn, I want to make sure the audience knows One Jewish State is available now at Amazon. It's been endorsed by everybody I respect. This is the hour of Israel because I had Senator Tom Cotton on right before you, Ambassador, and Dr. Oren was on to start the hour. I want people to know that One Jewish State, though, is not about current events. It's about an eternal problem. What do the, the Jews, God's chosen people, do with Judea and Samaria? Do you want people to understand? This is a real break with the classic blob argument that there's got to be a two-state solution. How's it been received by the blob? <laughs> well, look, it's, it's, it's sort of like, um, you know, telling, telling people not to take uh, penicillin, you know, you, you, which, 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 which I, I don't recommend. <laughs> I recommend people do take penicillin. I don't want to get into that argument. But it's like, it's like taking a, you know, a, um, a, a conventional piece of rock-solid wisdom that has motivated diplomats for 50 years and telling them that, that everything they've been working on has been wrong. So, of course, there's, there's a backlash. But what I'm finding you, which is interesting, is that the so-called smart people who, you know, for whom, you know, the two-state solution has been their mother's milk for 50 years, they don't want to engage. They don't, they don't want to talk to me because, you know, they, they look at the book and they realize that the arguments are pretty rock solid. And um, so I'm being ignored by a lot of people on the left because they don't want to engage. Um, it, you know, I think that I, that's going to change because it's so persuasive. I am not uh, I am not very conversant with West Bank versus Judea and Samaria. That's not one of the arguments I know, but I follow this fairly closely. I didn't know two thirds of what I learned in one Jewish state. One Jewish state is available now. Very surprising. I had no idea what I was getting into, which is an argument for the sovereignty of Israel over Judea and Samaria. And I did not realize, number one, that Ambassador Friedman was a trial lawyer. I thought he was a corporate lawyer who had been dispatched over to Israel to, be, to just manage the stuff. He's actually a trial lawyer and he knows how to make an argument. Number two, I did not know he was a deeply religious man who's got quite a lot of, I know you, you, you declare repeatedly in the book, Ambassador, you're not a rabbi. You're the son of a rabbi, though, and you're not a prophet. You're not a son of a prophet. But I didn't know anything about Jethro's kids being here and there, uh, being related to the Druze. I didn't know about the Kabbalistic tradition of intermarriage. Yeah, I didn't know any of that stuff. How long have you been study studying Torah? I don't know. Let's say I'm 66 years old, probably uh, 61 years, I would say, I've been studying I am, I'm just very impressed. I have not seen anyone make the argument from Scripture for sovereignty over Judea and Samaria and then merge it with the argument for something akin to Commonwealth for Puerto Rico status. Would you want to give a nutshell of what your, your argument is about Puerto Rico so that people understand that? Because that's when I said I got to read every page of this book. Sure. Well, well look, the, um, the, the thesis of the book is that only Israel can... Uh, can take over Judea and Samaria or the West Bank in a way that brings security, peace, dignity, human rights to everybody there, including the Palestinians. So that's the that's the overall thesis of the book. Um, the, the problem has always been this: um, Israel uh, must remain, as the title suggests, one Jewish state. There's only one Jewish state in the world. It's the size of New Jersey. We don't want to change that. Um, it's not it's not fair to the Jewish people, and it's not consistent with God's will, and it's not good for anybody else either. So let's have one Jewish state. Now, what happens if Israel absorbs another 2 million um, Palestinians? Um, it could be swapping a security risk, if you will, for a demographic risk. Do, we, do you want to let the Palestinians at the ballot box uh, potentially destroy the one Jewish state? And so um, we need to come up with some sort of a governance system that kind of threads the needle as between the right of people to plot their own destiny, and, uh, uh, which, which I, I believe in, and, and the right of the Jewish people to have a single Jewish state in the land as to which the Jewish people have the best title uh, compared with any other people to any plot of land in the world. So, you know, we're looking at alternatives, and the one alternative that struck me was, uh, was, was Puerto Rico. It, it, it was kind of after acquired property by the United States. The United States acquired the territory of Puerto Rico, you know, in the late 19th century. It's, it's, a, it's a wholly owned territory. Uh, America has sovereignty over Puerto Rico. 
Um, but what about the people that live in Puerto Rico? Do they, you know, do they have the same rights as people living on the mainland? The, an the answer is no. They don't vote in national elections. Now, this has been analyzed over a course of 100 years. There's about 20 Supreme Court decisions that try to, 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 try, try to manage, you know, the same two points, you know, people's human rights, human dignity, and the fact that, you know, not everybody gets to vote um, in a national election, especially if, you're, if your territory is acquired after the fact. After the fact, and so I point out that you know, in Puerto Rico, um, they are American citizens. They don't vote in national elections. They do have control over their own taxation. They 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 and they do have their own constitution, um, but but they are completely uh, subject to the um, the American sovereign. Um, it actually works there because there are reciprocal benefits that work for both sides. Most prominently, when there's a hurricane, right? A hurricane in Puerto Rico can be very dangerous. And FEMA in America will take care of making sure that people in Puerto Rico don't live underwater. Um, so what my, my suggestion is, and by the way, it's only a suggestion if, you know, we, we can come up with 10 other ways to thread this needle. But my point is that just because, you know, you acquire a territory and don't give the people there um, the right to, to control your national, your national leadership, as long as you do give them, you know, basic human rights and the rights to control their own local destiny, which is what I suggest, you're the farthest thing from an apartheid, unless America is an apartheid state, which I don't believe anybody thinks it is. I think it, I think it does satisfy you know, most people's concerns about human rights. So that's the Puerto Rico analogy. I suggest that the Palestinians under Israeli sovereignty will have local autonomy, will have the ability, if, if it makes sense for them and for Israel to, to control their own taxation system, run their own local uh, affairs, but nonetheless be subject to Israeli sovereignty. I think, and I think it's, it'll be the best thing for the Palestinians and for the people of Israel, uh, primarily because America is a first world economy. I'm sorry, Israel is a first world economy. Israel has uh, a track record of human rights. Israel's got an incredible track record of empowering its Arab minority, which is 20% of the Israeli population already. So that's, the, that's where Puerto Rico comes in. It's an example of how we can um, thread this needle to, re to retain one Jewish state, but at the same time providing um, you know, human rights and dignity and, and, and self-governance to the Palestinian people living in Judea and Samaria. You know, Ambassador Friedman, the reason no one wants to debate you is that you're a trial lawyer and you know how to put the premise forward, tell people what you're going to say, say it and tell them what you said, and then marshal data and evidence on behalf of your argument. Most compellingly, the status of Palestinians who are Israeli citizens, both in the Knesset, they served in one government, but their yep. achievement in higher education and per capita income is just so significantly higher you're making an argument that the Palestinians would be much better off as their own sovereign entity without voting rights in the Israeli national elections, but like the Puerto Ricans who enjoy American sovereignty when, when the benefits are there. I, I don't think anyone's going to get in the ring with you. They're going to get demolished. Did you run into that during your time in Israel and at the State Department? Oh, yeah. That's my, that's my first book, uh, Sledgehammer. Yeah, it's all about that. Yeah, look— um, I think that um, if you have, especially in the United States government, if you have an agenda and you think about it and you really focus on it and you make sure at all times that it's going to bring honor and respect to your country and your president, uh, and if, in my case, you have a good relationship with the president, you get a lot done. And, um, and, and I used to, when I, when I was working in the government, I used to say, you know, every day that I don't accomplish something towards my, you know, my agenda is a wasted day. And I don't want to waste any days because I'm only here for a short period of time and I've got to make it count. So, um, yeah, let's listen, thank God that we had a lot of good, a lot of good days in government. And, um, and I, I, uh, I hope I, I hope I get that opportunity again. You know, our, our mutual friend, Secretary Pompeo has told me he got a few regrets about leaving some people in place at the State Department. And now, after reading One Jewish State, I gather it's the Israel division. Because I, I thought Breckenridge Long and his ghost was gone, but apparently not. I had never known about the settler violence report. I didn't know it until I listened to you describe as ambassador, it was your obligation to review the work product of the State Department with regards to the human rights violations alleged against Palestinians by the settler community. I'm so glad you took the time because I'm kind of astonished by what I didn't know about Palestinian violence against Israelis that is um, not covered in the American press. 
is covered in the Israeli press and the prosecution of settlers who commit violence against Palestinians is thorough and prompt within the Jewish state. I, I, do you think you made any headway with the Breckenridge Longs of 2024? Um, you, what I found with most of these people is that they are, uh, I hate to use the word, but in many respects, they're, they're cowards. When, when I was there, uh, you know, for a year or so, they thought that, you know, this was the junior varsity coming through, the summer interns coming through, and we're just going to going to roll them and that's that and after a year or so when they saw that we weren't falling for it they kind of fell in place because you know they they have careers and they understand that you know we can fire them or we can move them off to places where they don't want to be and so they fall in line and they and they kind of yes you to death um and but you don't really know you know or you suspect that they're not really with you and then as soon as you leave office they come out of the woodwork and turn on you again so um there's a lot of that in the state department um it's it's very much still there uh, there's a bias towards the Palestinians that's enormous. But what's crazy about it is that there's also a self-imposed ignorance that is um, that is shocking because you got people living, you know, and working in Israel in the U.S. embassy that write these reports about about the Palestinians and about Palestinian violence and about how difficult life is in the in Judea and Samaria for them in the West Bank, and they've never been there. And I asked them, what what do you add to this discourse if you can't go there. And they said, well, we can't go there because um, we don't want to insult the Palestinians by stepping foot in territory when we're working for the embassy of Israel. You know, we don't think Israel has jurisdiction over this area. So I said, so, so go home. I mean, if you're going to write reports about a place where you're not going to, just go home. You know, you can read the same NGO reports that you rely upon from Washington is from Israel. So when I was there, I used to go, I used to travel all the time to uh, Judea and Samaria. I thought there was a lot to learn there meeting not only with Jews, meeting with Palestinians as well. And here's, by the way, the big takeaway that nobody, you know, the kind of the dirty secret. Nobody, none of the Palestinians want to live under Palestinian rule. I mean, none of them. Absolutely none of them. I mean, you'd be, you know, they're looking at Mahmoud Abbas, who's now in the 19th year of his four-year term, completely corrupt. I mean, he's got hundreds of millions of dollars stashed away, as do all his predecessors. Uh, he favors his cronies. Um, no human rights, no freedom of religion, no freedom of speech. Uh, no, no, the, the economy is uh, a shambles, you know, less than less than 10 percent of what Israel produces per capita. Nobody wants to live under Mahmoud Abbas or any of his or anybody that he's grooming to take over. They, they, they see across the green line. They look at Israel. They look at the Arabs in Israel and they say, that's the life that we want. We want some of that. We don't want we don't want to live. We don't want to work for these, you know, be served, you know, be subservient to these Palestinian dictators. So they can't say it because they get thrown in jail if they do that. There's no freedom of speech in this part of the world, in that part of the world. But for Israel to take over Judea and Samaria and to run it and to bring, you know, and to kind of export the values and the commerce and the know-how and the wisdom and the, and, and the education and the healthcare to that part of this troubled area is a massive win for the Palestinians. They'll, they'll t they tell it to me secretly as long as I promise not to out them. But that, that's their view, and, and that never comes across. And the State Department self-imposes ignorance upon itself just to make sure this never gets out. I mean, nobody it doesn't fit within their narrative, which is a false narrative, but this is the narrative they've adopted for 50 years. Well, it's also an anti-Semitic narrative. My favorite part of one Jewish state, and I have many favorite parts, is that by name you call out the moron of morons, Joseph Burrell. I think he's anti-Semitic. I don't, you didn't use that term. You said he was anti-Israel, but what do you think? He is a moron. Look, um, the EU is, a, I mean, just imagine what the EU would, EU would be like if it wasn't for Hungary and the Czech Republic. They're, they're the only ones who put a break on the EU from acting as a collective because they have, they need to be unanimous. Uh, every other country is, um, you know, I mean, they hired him. Like, I don't, I, I mean, Burrell is terrible, but Burrell is a, is, a, is, is a product of the people that hired him. They can fire him if they don't like him, but they haven't fired him yet. So, no, I mean, he goes out of his way to, uh, it, look, if you're going to, you know, you, you, know, you want to make a, 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 offer some platitudes about, about civilian casualties, I get it. You know, civilians, nobody wants civilian casualties. I think Israel does more than anyone in the world in history. To minimize civilian casualties, but look, it's an easy, it's an easy throwaway line if you want to show, if you want a virtue signal. But Hezbollah, 
I mean, you know, uh, there aren't any civilians being killed in Lebanon. I mean, they're not. Hezbollah has killed over uh, 230 U.S. Marines. They've killed, you know, people working in the Beirut embassy. They've killed Jews in Argentina. They've killed Americans all over the world. I mean, Hezbollah, really? This is where you want to plant your flag in support of them? I mean, it's just unthinkable. Right before I read One Jewish State, I read Jack Carr's new book on Beirut. And I didn't join the Reagan administration until 1985, so I wasn't there when that, the fiascos happened in Beirut. But uh, justice was served out over the weekend to the Marine families who have been waiting 40 years for it. Uh, Mr. Ambassador, I want to make sure that we cover, before we run out of time here, and we got to play most of this tomorrow morning, is the American Jewish community. Now, I'm not Jewish. My wife isn't Jewish. Her grandfather was. But, but we are not Jewish. And I'm Roman Catholic and not one of the evangelicals like Pastor Hagee, who has a prophetic vision for Israel. I'm just, I'm just a basic believer like you. I am curious, though, if the fear that you talk about rising in the Jewish community is beginning to realize they've got to use their power. John Podhort says now is the time for Jews in America to use their power and to stop funding the institutions that are actively anti-Semitic, like UCLA and Harvard. My alumni, I'm an alum of Harvard and Michigan Law, they're both got their incredibly anti-Semitic student bodies and protests and organizations. Do you think American Jewry is waking up that they've got to use their power? I, I think so in certain in certain places. I mean, you know, look, I'm uh, you know, I, I went to two major offenders as well, Columbia University and NYU Law School. And, you know, look, I'm oh, you win. I'm mortified. <laughs> you win. I, win. I do. I, I think I, well, I don't win by much. I win, but not by a lot. Um, you know, I think, um, I agree with, uh, American Jews using their power, thinking more about, you know, protecting their own franchise and not just worrying about everybody else. But the most important thing I think about curbing anti-Semitism, and this is what I don't hear from, from much in the Jewish community. We have to, we can't, I don't think we can change a lot of these other people. I think, you know, we're, we're stuck in a world where there's a lot of haters of the Jewish people, you know, at the margins, we can affect it. We can't affect it in, in big numbers. But we can change ourselves, you know, we can change who we are and how we perceive ourselves. And the one thing where I think the Jewish community in America has fallen down, with the exception of, you know, maybe 10 or 15 percent of those who really are observant and study, you know, all day long or, or go to get a good Jewish education. We need to know who we are and why we should fight for ourselves. Like, why, why am I keeping my last name as Friedman as opposed to I could change my name to Franklin? I don't look that Jewish. I could go assimilate into society. Nobody, you know, nobody would bother me. And, uh, you know, people would just, you know, they, I would just look at the Jewish issue as somebody else's problem. Why, why am I not doing that? Because I understand about the 3,000 year old majestic legacy of what it means to be a Jew and, and, the, and, and you know, what we received from our parents and our grandparents going back thousands of years um, about the significance of Torah study, about the significance of, of, of the faith that we have about the values that we've given to the world and why it's worth fighting for. And until we understand why it's worth fighting for, that's how we defend ourselves. And I don't think we're strong enough right now to defend ourselves at that level. Um, and that's what scares me the most. I mean, you know, those who've got, you know, lots of power and money, yeah, they'll, they'll, they'll do that. But what about all the, you know, the millions of Jews, there's three or four million Jews that don't know what it means to be Jewish, don't know why, it's, why it matters to be Jewish. And if we don't fix that, um, I don't think we're really up to the fight. I also want to close by making sure people understand. You will be surprised by one Jewish state. And I wrote down the most surprising thing is that you're not making the argument that the Haredim have to continue their, um, uh, their deferment from the IDF. You're not making the argument that Arab Americans don't have to, Arab Israelis don't have to serve. You're making the opposite. So Ben Veer is not a, a, a Smotrich. They're not going to be happy with you, right? They're not going to like one Jewish state. You went where a lot of conservatives don't want to go, which is everybody's got to serve. What's the reaction in Israel to one Jewish state? Uh, well, it's coming out in Hebrew in another week. So we'll really see the, ah. you know, a lot of Israelis prefer to read it in Hebrew. Look, the, um, um, you know, the, you can't sustain a country where 40% of the country, 20% Haredim, 20% Arabs don't serve. I mean, it's just not, it's just not, not real. It's not a, it's, it, it, it brings so much division, whether or not these will be great soldiers, whether or not they'll, they'll end up, you know, working KP duty, whether or not they'll end up, 
you know, just uh, doing kind of some civil service. Everybody's got to serve. Israel is a country where people serve their country. You have to serve the country. And you can't get away with this argument anymore that, um, that you know, sitting in a classroom is, is enough. Because there's plenty of soldiers who sit in the classroom and also um, serve their country. And they're some of the best soldiers that Israel has. Um, look, I, I don't, you know, I, I didn't write this to make anybody happy. I just wrote this to, uh, to lay out what I think is a, a sustainable path for Israel's future. And one which, again, I think um, uh, for those who care about the Bible, and look, it still sells 2,000 copies an hour. You know, I mean, I wish my book would sell 1% of the, uh, of the Bible. You know, 20 million Americans buy a new Bible every year. It still matters to a lot of people. And if you, you know, it, without Israeli sovereignty over Judea and Samaria, Jews and Christians will become, will, will, will lose the opportunity to go see these places. And it really does bring the Bible back to life. When you can take your faith and anchor it in fact, and anchor it in real history, see that these, these, these stories really happened and see where they happened and see the evidence as to how they happened. I think you go back home and you are recharged and reinvigorated. And I think these places have to be preserved for both the Christian and the Jewish faiths. And only Israel is going to do that. And I think that's, that's another you know, big part of the argument. The facts that you present, I didn't know uh, the specifics of the expulsion from the Arab countries following World War II. And 900,000 Jews, I didn't realize that. I knew it happened. I didn't realize it was that big. I understand better now where Judea and Samaria fit into the overall vision for people who believe in sovereignty of Israel over it. Uh, and it's a fine argument, and it's wonderfully made. I, I want to recommend to everyone, you can't frame the argument. I loved your chapter about that. Don't frame the argument this way or that way. Just get the facts first. And that's mm -hmm. what I liked about One Jewish State. Congratulations, Ambassador Friedman. I hope you will continue to come back. You know, I only met you from afar. I accompanied National Security Advisor Bolton when he visited with Netanyahu and our visit to the Golan Heights where we we're going to sit down with you got got canceled because of the weather. But I was in the tunnel with you. The most sacred place on earth is in the tunnel next to the Holy of Holies. And do you think American opinion is changing dramatically on Israel in the aftermath of the last year since the horrific massacre of 10-7? I mean, I, 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 think, um, I think the um, the younger, you know, people under 30 have definitely moved away from Israel. Um, it, it, it is not by chance. It is, I think, part of a very well-orchestrated campaign. I think as soon as this war started, um, people who had been waiting for this moment, uh, they, they came out in force. A lot of money behind the anti-Israel movement. If you see all these different um, people that are speaking, you, know, you notice, by the way, there's no leader, right? There's no leader that's surfaced. Because um, if there's a leader, then you can put the leader on television and tear them apart with the fallacy of their argument. So there's no leader, just, just a crowd, just a mass. And, and that tells me that this is not organic. This is being organi organized. And you see, as people get up, they all speak, they all take out their iPhone and just read like, you know, like robots, they read from a, a prepared text. So somebody's behind this. I mean, you know, I mean, the, the kind of the Soros crowd, uh, others as well. I mean, there've been articles about where this money is coming from. Um, so it's very well orchestrated. Um, it's having a very, uh, very deleterious effect on, on, on Jewish uh, security in America. Um, I don't know where it's going to go. Like I, my argument, as I said earlier, my argument is we have to strengthen ourselves as Jews. We can't obsess about what other people think. I mean, we can, we can counter these arguments as best we can, but the numbers just don't, don't support that. And, you know, as you know, unfortunately, in this world, there are no, we're, not living, we're living in a fact-free world. I mean, people, you know, have their narratives and they reinforce them with their own media or their own social media, and it's very hard to, to block it. I mean, people are spending a lot of time on it. I'm not one of them because I'm just, I want to work on things I can control, and I think we can control the Jewish people, or at least influence the Jewish people. And uh, I'm focusing mostly on that. But it's, it's definitely, uh, look, a lot of people, you know, who were really experts in the 1930s in Germany are seeing a lot of similarities. Um, I don't think we're going to get to that point. But I'm, I'm also naturally optimistic. But I don't think we're going to get to that point, just because I do think the Constitution of the United States is a unique document. I agree with that. One last, I've been teaching con law since 1996, by the way. I didn't even know about the Puerto Rico cases. It just never comes up. So now I have to go learn that. Last question, Mr. Ambassador. Uh, it seems like 
I listen to the Times of Israel Daily Update. I read everything Habib Redigur does. I listen to Dan Senor. I listen to Yossi Klein Halevi and Danielle Hartman every time they put out, for heaven's sake. It seems like there's a, a kind of Trump derangement syndrome in Israel having to do with Netanyahu. Where does an average American Gentile get good news about Israel? Where would you send them if they can't read Hebrew, but they're kind of smart and they know what they're doing and they want to know the facts on the ground free of political stuff? I believe, I thought the Times of Israel was that, but their anti-Netanyahu bent is coming through every day. Yeah, I would I would look at JNS. I think it's called. I think it's Jewish News Service. Jonathan Tobin. Yes, I think he's a very uh, very serious guy and and puts out a daily uh, a daily news uh, feed. Um, I think I think they're the best um, for this stuff. But um, you're right. I mean, look, um, the Israeli news, the mainstream media in Israel is is further left than the mainstream media in America. And um, wow. but but look, here's what's different about Israel than any other country. You the younger people in Israel are more conservative than the older. The future of Israel is, is trending conservative. Um, that's, that's, you know, unique and it's not changing. And uh, because the younger ones have just grown up with this incessant drip, drip, drip every day of anti-Israel sentiment around the world and they're fed up. And, um, and, and, and the soldiers are incredibly brave and the people are very patriotic. Look, I'm I'm very bullish on Israel, notwithstanding the year that they've had. I'm very bullish. I think they've learned a very hard lesson from October 7th, but they've internalized the lesson. What they've done in the last two weeks is nothing short of miraculous how they've turned the tables on their enemies. Um, God's going to protect Israel. The Israeli people are going to protect Israel. Um, Jews in America, less confident, okay, but, but certainly confident about Israel. No, I'm confident about Israel. Um... Every Christian, Roman Catholic, Protestant, whatever de denomination, blessed to be a blessing, is learned in every Sunday school. And I think to the extent that the American church prospers as well, that partnership will continue. Ambassador Friedman, you've been very generous. I look forward to having you back. One Jewish state should be a bestseller, should be in everyone's desk. And get the facts before you make an argument about uh, Israeli sovereignty over Judea and Samaria, because if you've read Ambassador Friedman's book, you're going to change the way you think. Thank you, Mr. Ambassador. Thank you. Your pleasure being with you as always. Pleasure being with you. Bye-bye.